Today, I want to talk a little bit about the 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 overture that came out from South Texas Presbytery, and then continue on my discussion with the debating Doug thing that um, with Chris Gordon down in Escondido. So, thanks for joining me uh, live and. Um, uh, it's, it was interesting yesterday. I, I actually had no knowledge that this was going to happen. Um, but there is a, an overture. So an overture in the Presbyterian world is, uh, something that originates as I understand it in, in the, in a Presbytery level. So Presbyteries are kind of the regional church under which you have the, um, uh, the, the sessions and then, and that's kind of the local church, right? So you have your ministers at the local church, um, uh, with the elders form a session. And then above that, you have the Presbytery, which is a regional thing. Uh, and so that's why this overture came from South Texas Presbytery of the PCA, Presbyterian, Presbyterian Church in America. It should be of America, but that's, you know, uh, in America. And um, it, it's an overture is something as I, the broad category, I guess it's re, is essentially requesting the Presbyterian at the Presbytery level to do something. Um, it, it might have a more precise definition than that. Well, this one is... It's requesting that the um, the PCA General Assembly does a, a a study committee, a study committee on Christian nationalism, and I'll pull it up here in a in a second. I'll talk about it. Um, so apparently, uh, this I, I, this Presbyterian this Presbytery is serious enough, and they they want the 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 PCA to actually address this in a study. So as I understand, the the, the product of a potential study of a study committee is not technically binding, but it does have a lot of weight uh, because in the Presbyterian world, you have layers of authority, and th that document can easily inform sessions on their decisions. Uh, it can inform the Presbytery itself, uh, different Presbyteries, how they're going to act. And so there's a lot of power kind of at the local, regional uh, level. And that, then this can kind of, I think, empower them to do what they want with regard to Christian nationalism. I think it's, I have more to, I mean, it's it's very odd because the way it's, the way it's, the way it's worded, I'll go through it all. Um, but um, well, yeah, let's just kind of jump into this. You guys can see a little bit of it. I actually can't see that very well. Um, but yeah, as we go as we go through this thing, you can see you can see this is how it's worded. This is what I pulled from the uh, from the website. So I got this from the website uh, that is the South Texas Presbytery. Uh, my guess is that it's kind of a left leaning Presbytery. I'm not, you know, I can't be hundred percent sure about that. I guess, but that's just my guess. Uh, some of the people in it seem very adamantly opposed to me. Um, I do wonder if, um, as I'll go through it, if this is actually about me or it's about something else, or they're just using the term to get at someone else, because I'm not hundred percent sure it's about me to be very honest. Um, but, uh, so let's look through this. So South Tex Presbytery, there it is. And in, in all these things, they always have the whereas clause, which kind of like, kind of means in consideration of, or due to, or so it's kind of a broad category for these reasons. It's essentially stating the reasons for what they're requesting in kind of a very formalized sort of way. And um, this first one, as you can, as you can see in this, uh, this first one, there's a, been a, a debate in the PCA concerning the Teach the Moscow Theology and their publications among others, with regards to post-millennial post theo theo wait, hold on a second, I need to get it through it. Teachings of Moscow theology, their publications, among others, with regards to post-millennial theonomic reconstructionism and ethnic relations. Very interesting. So, you see Moscow theology. It's interesting that they would attach that to this right up front. It's like they're declaring exactly what this is about. That it's about uh, you know it's it's about Moscow man uh, well yeah Moscow man um, theology and uh, it's it's interesting because like who who among like the the Moscow crowd have adopted this uh, the the Christian nationalist label where it's well it's primarily primarily been Doug Wilson himself and maybe Toby Sumner I don't think anyone else that I know of has really adopted the label and even those guys are kind of like well I can work with it like I've heard Doug say several times 
that really, you know, I, I, I can work with the label, even though he's not, doesn't sound like he's hundred percent comfortable with it, but they frame it right off the bat as, as being this thing that is about, it's about uh, Moscow man. Um, and, and him alone, because I, I just don't know exactly who else is adopting, uh, the Christian nationalist label. And then it goes on to mention other things such as, uh, you can see, the uh, uh, post-millennial theonomic reconstructionism. It, it's which is fascinating because I'm the guy who, among uh, one other, so uh, among uh, Andrew Isker and um, Andrew Torba, wrote a book on Christian nationalism. Doug did mere Christendom, which kind of adopted some of adopted the term in a way. Uh, but I'm not post-millennial theonomic reconstructionist. <laughs> So you kind of want to right off the bat, like, are they, is this really even about me at all? Or is this actually just a way to use the drama surrounding the term or maybe some like hot takes that we've all made in the past where you just pile them up and say, look what Moscow has produced. And then look at, then they put a picture of Doug and, and it's all about Doug Wilson. And, uh, and, and that's the whole point of this. So really it's a, finally the PCA, I mean, I think they've done like, they've done like Federal Vision reports and stuff like that at the Presbyterian and other levels, but have they really been able to get at the Moscow man um, in, in, a, in a way? So I, I just don't know uh, what exactly up front what this is about because I don't really fit any of those molds. And another thing, they mentioned the ethnic thing, which is, as I understand it, the, the CREC, which is Doug Wilson's denomination, has done all sorts of ethnic, you know, like the ethnic vainglory, all, all those things. So, uh, I, I don't know exactly what they're talking about there. Uh, the, the next whereas clause uh, um, statement is these, they've been discussed publicly on the relationship of church and state, national conservatism. That's interesting too, because I guess some people like Time and Klein and others have presented at the NatCon conference. Maybe that's what they're referring to. And they're sometimes identified under the broad term Christian nationalism, which may not be synonymous with other viewpoints. Okay. Um, this is one of the fascinating things about the term. So I fully admit that like different people use it in different ways. Um, and it's uh, it's been fascinating to see kind of who adopts and who doesn't. Uh, because, I mean, this is one of the problems with this, this overture and using this broad term Christian nationalism is that what, like what exactly we know something is happening. Like we know something within the, the within the reformed world is happening. Is it Christian nationalism or is that just one part of it? I mean, take up my friend CJ Engel, uh, and he, he has said publicly numerous times that he essentially agrees with me on a, you know, large portion of my, of my work and things that I say. And yet he doesn't adopt the term Christian nationalism. And I get, I, I have no problem with that at all. Like I've said this dozens of times that I don't care if you like, don't like the term or you don't want to use the term or it's not rhetorically effective for your people. That's fine. Um, I, I just, you know, want you to affirm the argument. So, so CJ agrees with me on, on a large section or large parts of my, my, my work. Um, and, but doesn't identify as Christian national. So something, and, and something is happening in the reform world. So I, I wonder if what this, what this overture is trying to do is try to say, Hey, something's happening and let's call it broad Christian nationalism. And then in the end, what this report could possibly do is it could just kind of show it can, it can have this like cluster of 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 bad beliefs, and then the entire movement of what I would call kind of like the the new Christian right is then cast under suspicion by the the PCA report. Like that's my that's my guess of what they're trying to get at. Either that's that, or they're finally trying to to destroy or you know launch a um, cluster cluster bombs on Moscow to get Moscow man. I I don't know, um, but I, other people have already criticized it for this that they're just they're trying to capture too much. I mean, the Reconstructionists, for example, I, I don't need even know anyone personally who still identifies with that term. That's kind of an older term. 
old, like they're old dead guys who can't really defend themselves anymore. It says theonomy. There's a lot of theonomists. There's like differences between theonomists. So there's people who are theonomists who say they're Christian nationalists. There's theonomists who are adamantly opposed to me and Christian nationalism. Um, there's general equity theonomists. There's libertarian theonomists. There's like, I don't know, Bonsonite theonomists. So it's like, what, what exactly are you trying to capture? And then there's post mill where it's like, are you going to try to attach like a historic position uh, of post-millennialism to all this other stuff that's bad to try to discredit post-millennialism? I just, it, the rhetorical, I, 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 this just could go in several different ways, and I'm not entirely 100% sure what they're, what they're trying to get with all this. Um, the, there is the other, oops, there is the other question as to whether this could even pass. So the way these things work is they go up to, they start at the presbytery level, they go to General Assembly. The General Assembly, uh, the um, the uh, Overture Committee takes it, and then they have a chance to modify it. And then if it passes the committee, then as I, then it goes to the General Assembly floor, where it's then de debated and possibly modified, and then there's a vote. And then it passes. And it could take probably, I don't know, two years to have a report, and then the report has to be, be approved. And then they can be sent back for, for, I don't know, for clarification or modification. And then, you know, so like Presbyterians, I think it'll take forever for it to actually get through the process, even if it makes through the initial approval process. Um, people I, I know and trust doubt that it could actually pass in the first place, which if that's the case, then that's a, I would say a win for our side because then it shows the PCA is essentially not doing anything official about the new Christian right. And I think what these South Texas guys are doing, they're signal to probably the more left-leaning guys with the PCA that something needs to happen. We need to confront these guys. I, I think it, it it could be a strategic blunder for them to have this out um, because it could fail, which is which really means the PCA doesn't. In a way, you can interpret that as they just don't care. Like they it, they might care, but they don't care about it enough to go through this long process of trying to define these terms. I mean, even if they narrow it down to like Wolfian Christian nationalism, I mean, what are they going to say? Are they going to quote like, like Kevin DeYoung, he was very critical of the book, but he says like right in, right in front of the, of the review, he says that Wolf's retrieval project that is pulling sources from 16th and 17th centuries, he says in his words, largely correct. So are they going to acknowledge the fact that my sources and and my sources that I pull from, or that that my my use of the sources, which is how I interpret it young, is actually correct. Um, are they then going to publish a report that casts suspicion on the reformed tradition of the 16th and 17th centuries? I don't know. They probably might be on better ground if they start start attacking Reconstructionism or certain version of theonomy or perhaps even postmillennialism. I, I mean, my my, my conclusion is that amillennialism is probably more common in the 16th, 17th centuries, but um, but nevertheless, I mean, there were famous, important reformed theologians who were post-millennial, um, and there's some today who are probably considered more consistent with, like, PCA theology, so you're going to, I just don't know, um, if in the end, like, the left-leaning crowd, the report would be this mixture of, well, yeah, Calvin did think that, but, you know, what about Witherspoon or something? Like they're going to like pit, they're going to have to pit like Witherspoon against all, all of their, you know, all of their spiritual ancestors um, in the Reformed tradition. So uh, I'm not sure what they're going to do there. Um, going on to the, uh, there's been disagreement, confusion regarding these, what these various viewpoints actually teach. These variations have caused confusion, division, dissension among the congregants of PCA churches and disturbed PCA pastors and officers. All right, so these variations have caused confusion and division and dissension. This is like one of those rhetorical tactics, right? Where they, where they, they, they essentially do, this action would cause like a tremendous amount of dissension precisely because it's so broad that what is the report going to attack, cast suspicion upon, 
you know, like, like Keller said, it's not so much what it says, or what it, it's what it does, right? <laughs> so if Keller says that, you know, he could affirm it in the, you know, as it says in the letter, but he can't affirm it because of what it's doing, aren't people just going to interpret it as exactly what it's doing? You're going to say all the post-millennialists and PCA are now cast under the suspicion of, you know, Moscow man or something like that, or, or under the suspicion of, of Wolf's, um, I don't know, paleoconservatism. So it's, a uh, you're essentially going to cause division and dissension. But the thing is, like, to the left, the left will accuse you of division. And then when they cause what appears to be division, they'll just say that they're they're just stating the truth or they're just concerned. Um, th that's always how it goes. Like, you know, you put, you put, like, they'll say, they'll say, you know, Wolf's book has caused division. And then they'll do a report, cause division, and claim it's not division, they're just seeking answers. They just want the purity and the peace of the church. Um, in the end, like the peace of the church for the left is to essentially eliminate the right. I mean, you gotta, you gotta keep that in mind. Like in the end, it's like, it's not division because you're separating the, you're separating the, 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 the dividers. It's like the intolerant tolerance of the left. It's the same sort of rhetorical move. Um, but uh, okay, let's see. Uh, you guys seeing down there? Okay. Uh, disturb PCA pastors. That's interesting. It disturbs them. All right. They're concerned. The doctrines once taught under the heading of federal vision continue to change, adopt highly variable language, and even abrogate language formally expressed since the convening of the PCA at interim study in the federal vision 2007. All right. So again, no one can can accuse me of federal vision. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so again, like I, I and I don't know that this is the, like the irony thing. The most like federal vision guys, the most federal vision guys that I know, like Lightheart, um, are adamantly opposed to me. Like uh, even like R Rich Lusk seems a little more open t to me, I guess. But but he's still very critical. So the people who are like actually federal vision are um well i, I don't know if I, i'm just assuming i don't know if they still claim that whatever if anyone's federal vision lightheart's federal vision right so um those guys are opposed to me and but now there's things like the language is changing now it's going underground under terms like christian nationalism and now they're you know they're trying to appeal to sources in the reformed tradition it's all just kind of like silly but i don't know i i, I don't I'm, I'm not entirely sure what in even like Doug Wilson's political project, like his political theology could be considered um, federal vision, unless there's some sort of like covenant of works thing. I, I don't know. I mean, that, that would be, I, I don't even, I, I've never even thought like when I read his book and listen to him on these like on political topics, like federal vision doesn't register in my mind when I hear him talk, but perhaps there is, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, but I think that that's also, it sounds like it's it's a matter of that they're just suspicious. It's like these same people and Wolf's book comes out and I mean I should say something about the origin of the book. So the the book didn't arise like like I when I I had this idea in my head to write a book on Christian nationalism and um I, you know I came to agreement with Canon and Canon was excited and I was excited and we published the book. I was not at no point in time did I think hmm, these guys are now adopting Christian nationalism. I didn't think that at all. I thought I just thought that Canon Canon was just a a, a public uh, they were they were willing to take an like an edgier book. Um that doesn't mean that Canon had to like, you know, now wave the, the Christian nationalist flag. Um I mean they made some graphics and some shirts and stuff or because that's what they do. It's fun. Um but I I never expected Doug to like adopt the term as his and at, at now he says he's like he can work with the term which is fine um but he doesn't uh um so i, I didn't expect that they that they would um even even adopt that but uh my my theology it, my, my theology is far more like traditional classical protestant and then um I, then i would say like doug wilson's is uh and or just the moscow kind of theology i just said at moscow theology uh I, I would say mine's more classical protestant in, in theology uh or scholastic they might call me or thomistic or they might call me that um and i'm, I'm not exactly kyperian like they are they're more kyperian 
Um, but uh, I, I just assume they wanted to publish a book because they thought it it could sell well and also that it um, was broadly reformed. Um, and so, but anyway, so I, there's the point being is there's no kind of like, it's not as, it's not as if the, like there's some hidden federal vision thing that I affirm. Um, I've even, I've been critical to CREC online, <laughs> um, probably too much, uh, that more than I should have been, but, um, but it's, so it's, it's weird to, that they're like really, I, I don't, I don't think we have separate projects, um, but to try to cast like suspicion of at least my Christian nationalism because it flows from Moscow is completely just wrong headed. Um, and I, you know, there's, I don't, there's not like animosity or anything between, there's friendly relations between me and the Canon guys, but, um, but we're theologically, we're just generally different. And so it had nothing to do with me adopting or, or assuming in, or trying to put underground their own, their theology, um, in, in my categories. Uh, but, but again, th this is what leads me to think that actually this is about Doug Wilson. Like this is using, like, it's like this, it's that, yeah, like I said earlier, how do you get at Doug Wilson's, uh, theonomic post mill stuff? Well, you cast it in broad terms under Christian nationalism. You pull from things I've said, you pull from things Torba said, you pull from things that Isker said or CJ or Time and Klein or something published in American Reformer. Um, you put that all in the report, all of it looks very scary. And the, 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 uh, the kind of leader of the movement is, is Doug Wilson through Canon Press and Canon Plus and all those outlets. And now with all that sort of baggage, they just kind of dump more baggage on, on Doug because the report looks very scary. Um, that's my guess. All right, it says many members of PCA churches continue to encounter, be influenced by, and are disturbed by these teachings from various online sources. There you go. So they're they're basically saying, hey, we need to look into some of the the the, um, the disturbing tweets that various people have sent out and put that in the report and say these are concerning. And then questions raised regarding certain conformity of these viewpoints to the system of doctrine taught in the Westminster Standards as held has held by the PCA. Now. That could be interesting. I don't know if there needs to be a study committee, but I do. Th I do think that there is just not enough um, work being done on, and, and maybe it's just I'm not aware of it. But I, I don't think I think there needs to be discussion uh, on what the American version of the the American revisions mean in the Westminster Confession. I wrote an article about maybe about, oh, about a month or a few weeks ago in American Former on that. Uh, trying to show that you could actually affirm Christian civil order, you could punish blasphemy, um, you can have you can have Sabbath laws under the American version. Um, you can privilege Christianity. You can privilege Christianity to the point that you want to maintain the Christian nature of the state of the of the people. You, so you protect the people as a Christian people. So I would argue you you can do all those things from the American version, but that needs to be argued argued out and. Uh, I, I do think there is a, uh, one of the, yeah, so I think what's flowing from this is that there is a a return, you say, to the sources in the Reformed tradition. So people who are influenced by some of the uh, Reformed political theology of the 80s and 90s and, and earlier, um, people who are kind of broadly Kuyperian who thought that was just Reformed thought now are being introduced to more classical Reformed political theology. And... Uh, in a lot of ways, I think it does more work for them, especially in our moment. Like in a in a hostile, like ethnically hostile world, it's kind of doing more work to understand reality um, and also understand politics and what we need to do um, better than better than uh, in the past, where it was kind of like this blueprintish type of universal program. You know, this is the law, boom, just to uh, enact it. Whereas now, politics is more of understanding of a, a human art. Um, that needs to be informed by theology, but also uh, it has to be grounded in a people and a place and, and their way of life and tradition. So, and more than that, the classical Protestant categories of theology that come to inform all that and make it possible. Um, so people are returning to that, which I think threatens some of the R2, like the reformed modernist 2K guys. Because I, I said this in, in my last video, what's incredible about these guys is they were like, uh, well, unashamedly just quote 
the the reformers like look calvin was two kingdoms you know look rutherford was two kingdoms um look turretin and Althusius and all these guys were two kingdoms and it's incredible because like the very next line that they quote is often a line saying oh yeah by the way the civil magistrate should enforce true religion punish heresy blasphemy you know all those things protect the church through the the civil sword and it's just like it's over their head and then but for, for so long for too long in reply people would just reject the two kingdom theology of, of the reformers and they jump into this kind of like kyperian uh like um i don't know like reconstructionist or something thing like they, they would jump into that kind of kyperian one kingdom thing um and instead of going back and now people are discovering well wait wait a second like all of that theology in the past actually you know scott clark it should be embarrassing that you would list 20 guys in the reformed tradition who affirm two kingdoms theology when all 20 guys also want civil magistrates to punish blasphemy uh, or have a sabbath law or, or even or do more than that um that should be funny and i mean i think it's funny whenever i see it it's actually useful to me like there are times when i go to like scott clark's website and he'll like, oh, look at these 20 guys who affirm. And then I, I got my references. <laughs> you got the references. Now you go to the source. And again, like the next paragraph, next line, next page, it says exactly what you think it says. So thanks, Scott. I mean, I, I appreciate the work you've done for me. Um, and uh, the same thing with Van Drunen. I mean, Van Drunen seems like a nicer guy than Scott Clark. But uh, Van Drunen does a whole work on natural law and the two kingdoms. And uh, somehow that's supposed to make us affirm secularism and neutrality. Um, and somehow, I don't know, it's just, it's bizarre stuff. How'd I get on that? I don't even remember how I got on that stuff. Um, all right, uh, let's, let's just keep going down here a little bit more. I don't know how I got on that stuff, but, uh, oh yeah, what they got, yeah. The point being is like, all this could be interesting. Like it could be interesting report if they focused on that. And it was actually, uh, like a, a, a balanced committee of people who are, I don't know, essentially secularists and uh, people who are, yeah, like the, uh, between people who are uh um what what is it put yeah people who are political theists versus people who are political atheists is how i would frame it okay viewpoints that have brought confusion on theological definitions and concepts that have disrupted the peace period and progress again like i don't know i, I don't know of anyone who's questioned my theological definitions they've questioned the other things around that but definitions I, I don't really know that so i don't again i don't think this is about me this is this is like a, a criticism this is a classic criticism of federal vision um which i i think is in some ways warranted but again i don't know why they they bring this up now and why they bring it up under the context of context of christian nationalism um i think it's very important that if we're going to use a term in the context and you're in a reformed denomination if you're going to use justification or baptism or whatever you should use that term if you're going to use it in a way that's different theologically from the confession or you're going to nuance it in some way you should be open about that to not to again to avoid confusion i don't know where i did that i don't know where doug has done that in in terms of his political theology so i mean people have criticized him for for that in his, some of his more purely theolo theological works like on doctrine of god and other things but um but I, I don't know where he's done that in, in the subject of politics. So again, I'm not really sure what that is even getting at at all. If someone thinks that I have misused a theological term or statement, um, then I'd love to know because I, I tried to do as best I could to maintain um, precision and accuracy uh, of terms with regard to the theological side in my work and i try to do that and I'm, but i'm not a theologian so if people find that i'm always very eager to know where i've made errors in that and then this is kind of the, the last thing this is almost like not I, I think it's last but it's 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 central and it says church courts have the responsibility to determine questions of doctrine seriously and in general to maintain truth and righteousness condemning erroneous opinions which tend to bring injury to the peace purity and progress of the church so it's almost an exact quote from their Book of Church Order, um, chapter 11, section four. And uh, this makes me think, now you think like church courts, like Sessions of Church Court, the Presbyters of Church Court, and then the General Assemblies of Church Court, as I understand it. Which means they're talking about empowering sessions, like, you know, Board of Elders, 
and they are empowering presbyteries to use this report in judicial proceedings. I mean, that's what a court does. Um, so they're using this as a as a way to, at the lower kind of regional and local levels, to essentially police their um, their uh, their their jurisdiction. Which makes me really wonder, like, what what exactly they're going to do with it. So um, now, will this thing even pass? Uh, I I don't even I don't know. Um, yeah, w will this thing even pass? I I, 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 again, I don't really know. What, whatever. I mean, I think that if what's going to happen, of course, like this is going to wait till next year. Not going to happen till whenever June or July, whenever they have the, their next general assembly. And um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussion between now and then. And I'm sure the overture committee is going to already have their idea of what words should be in there, what phrases and and uh, it should be in there, not in there. And uh, so the the version of it could be refined. And maybe the strategy here is to do something broad and then let it kind of narrow down to something specific. Uh, and um, so it, it'll be interesting to see what what eventually comes of that. Um, I, again, I, I think the strategy for their side is is just a bad strategy because I think it's going to fail. And if it fails, it'd be easy to show that, like, look, the PCA just it it wants to deal with the the uh, the, the sexual stuff in the Missouri um, um, Presbytery, so it wants to deal with that, but it doesn't want to deal with Christian nationalism. So what is it? What does that signal? Like that signals to the broader denomination. It signals to the OPC, signals to Presbyterians in general that th that they um, want to essentially leave things as they are. And the irony, I mean, the funny thing is, like, it's almost like they, whether they act or don't act, whether they approve or disapprove this, it's not going to stop the spread of the influence. Like, it's not just like me. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm just a guy with a camera or whatever. I don't know. But um, I, I'm, I'm a nobody. But the fact is, more and more people, like seminary students, like they'll read Turretin on the Doctor of God, but then they'll read his section on ecclesiology where he says the civil magistrate should protect her religion. And instead, in the past, it was like, well, that was an old time. But now they they can't just they can't just dismiss that anymore, right? More and more books are coming out from the from our tradition that are presenting the arguments. And I, I think more and more, like people are seeing that, like the the supposed reformed, like the true reformed uh, political theology that you find at Westminster West, is just increasingly absurd. It'll become more absurd because, like I've said this before, but Westminster West, it's not only I, I think it's absurd um, on its face. I think it's absurd and well, I don't, well, I'm not absurd. Well, I think it leads to. Um, doctrines you ought to reject, like I think it's antinomian um, in conclusion, in consequence, not maybe not in principle, but in consequence. So therefore, if it is in consequence, if something happened antecedently that's, that went wrong, um, I, I think also it was developed in a, in a world in which Christianity was, could kind of coexist well. I mean, there was always kind of the battle, spiritual battles going on, but you could kind of coexist but what was that that show in the '90s called, like Seventh Heaven or something like that? Oh, is that, is that what it was called? You guys can something like that, where like even that, I mean, it was hokey and it was goofy and this probably wasn't very good. But but um, but but there was like a positive portrayal of a minister and a, a regular family and going through their various kind of silly trials. But nowadays, you'd never find that. You find some like you know some homosexual priest or, or minister or something like that. Um, you just wouldn't find it. So there's just, but no, the point is that that theology was developed, two kingdom theology or the, like the modern version of two kingdom theology was developed in a world where neutrality kind of made sense. The problem with that though, is that little period of time, I said this in the last video, so I apologize for repeating myself, but that little period of time, you know, maybe like post 1950 up into like, you know, whatever Ren says, it's like 2014. Um, but whatever, whatever it was, that period of time was one in which you could, it was plausible to, to, to develop a political theology 
in which we could all just kind of get along. That somehow all of this is just working out because we have any, there's no public acknowledge of, acknowledgement of God or Christianity. There's nothing in the Constitution that says Christianity. Now we have prayers and Bible reading out of schools. You know, people are still going to public school, and yeah, there's some evolution stuff here and there, and there's like hints of homosexual stuff here and there. But generally speaking, everything's good. Now it's just like utter hostility. And so that hostility points to the fact that something, that the assumptions of, of modern two kingdom theology, um, those assumptions are false. That they, those assumptions arose from historical conditions in which neutrality seemed plausible. But now that like neutrality seems absurd or implausible, now you can reflect back and think, wait, that seemed plausible to me because I could get along. I could go to, I could, you know, I, I, I didn't have, I didn't like suffer utter, um, I, I couldn't get fired for, for thinking a dude in a dress is, is, uh, insane. Okay. Now things have changed, but at the same time, not everyone's going back to Kuyperianism. And why? Because a lot of the Kuyperian guys like, uh, Sandlin and these other guys, they, they are essentially just kind of like globalists. Like they, you know, um, they're just your old kind of like neocons. They have no sense of nationhood, um, no sense of peoplehood. Like the, some of their ideas are just kind of absurd and, and don't, um, meet with our, um, the, the, the very like natural relations that we, that we experience today. They don't map onto reality. Again, they might have in the past, but they don't anymore. And, and so even like the Kuyperian stuff is just, is falling away. So what, what is actually, I think the way forward, and I think where people are moving is a type of like respecting human difference, respecting natural law, that politics is prim primarily concerned with earthly good and social life is about earthly good. One sense of like one part of earthly good is that it's naturally good to kind of be among people who are similar to you. So you can complete common projects, you can complete common good, you can actually pursue the common good. There's no like strife or um, misunderstanding. And that's all rooted in a type of understanding man as a human being, as a natural being uh, with natural limitations, with natural principles of sense of order, with uh, natural needs. And you can't just like impose this foreign, this kind of foreign theology. What's interesting is like from like the Kuyperians are in a way multiculturalists and the radical two kingdom guys are also multiculturalists and somehow they just meet together. Um, I, I don't, I don't actually see a huge difference between like your David Bonson, Sandlin and your Van Drunen. I know in the theology, the way they get there is different, but they strike me as both just just neoconservatives like they're the typical neoconservatives of invade and invade the world and invite the world i don't know the big difference between them um you know they'll all be upset about that but it's one reason why i think i've drawn the ire of both crowds is that i'm a i'm, a, I'm trying to like separate i'm trying to say that grace assumes nature doesn't destroy it you know it doesn't like grace doesn't suddenly say hey nations yeah, just invite the world and then we can evangelize them and everything's just, you know, kumbaya and that that's just, it's, it's a, so anyway, again, different world. I, I don't know how I got into that, but here we go. Um, is there anything left here? Uh, yeah, it gets down to the bottom there, the bound to the, blah, blah, blah. where is it? Is it more? Yeah, yeah. So thus be resolved, uh, overtures, blah, 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 blah. study the political developments of federal vision theology the political developments of federal vision theology to study the above named viewpoints and their formulations and similar viewpoints deemed necessary by the committee. It's, I, I don't, <laughs> I, the only federal vision people and like Doug Wilson's even denied that term. I mean, whenever I hear like Toby talk about theology, he always just strikes me as a like a post mill classical Protestant. Maybe I'm wrong, but like Toby Sumter str strikes me as just a Westminster guy who's post mill, who you know who who um is kind of okay with natural law, but not totally. It's kind of like mixed with some Ky Kyperianism. So I don't know where this federal and then like Doug Wilson, like he says he's F V light or if not at all. So I and then like Peter Peter Lightheart repudiates Christian national. I just I just don't. Very, very strange to me. I, I don't get it. Uh, 
Yeah. All right. Well, well, that's that. Uh, any questions in the chat about anything I said? I don't remember anything I said, but, um, but uh, I, I, so I don't, yeah, again, I don't think it's going to pass. Maybe it will, but whatever. It, 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 in the end, like, it'll be, it'll be a fun ride because like, people don't know if I'm, if I am or am not in the PCA. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I am or not. They don't know if I am or not. Um, like no one under suspicion, like, you know, it's weird. Like the people in the PCA, uh, I, I don't know anyone, first of all, in the, do I? Well, I know some anonymous people, but um, like someone like Zach Garris, he doesn't claim Christian nationalism. Um, Aldo doesn't claim it, but they are kind of older style, to my knowledge, older, older style Westmin, what Westminster confession guys. Um, so they are on that side. But if that's the case, why don't you study that stuff? Like, why don't you, why don't you study uh, whether or not you can take an exception to some of the, the language in the American Revision if you're going to affirm the, 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 the older Westminster Confession, which, as I understand, has already kind of been left open to the, the sessions and the presbyteries in the first place. So why even bring this Federal Vision stuff up in, at all? Like, who, who in the PCA has been influenced by Federal Vision? I... Like, does anyone know? Anyone know anyone in the in the PCA who's been influenced by by the by Federal Vision? Um, maybe the, I'm, I'm sure there's some theonomists, but you don't have to be like you don't have to be FV if you're a theonomist. You don't have to be FV if you're postmillennialist. Um, I guess even Reconstructions. I don't know who claims that anymore, but um, but yeah. All right. Well, I got, uh, let's see. Um, I don't think I was able to get this to work, but I, what I want to go to now, if I can get this to work, I might have to switch over to, uh, my other headphones. Um, I want to go to some of the, some of the, the discussion that Doug had and Jared Longshore had with Chris Gordon. I, I did the first half. The, 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 um, the video clip is sped up by like 15%. So, uh, I, you know, the audio should be fixed a little bit, but it might sound a little bit weird. So just to, I guess, full disclosure, Chris does have good audio system. <laughs> um, and so whatever sounds coming through here, if it doesn't sound good, it's, it's due to me and not due to them. So let's, uh, let's open this up and, uh, hopefully I can hear it. Oop, wait, nope, that's not it. There's actually, you're onto something, but I do think Moscow has something going there. Stick a pin in that as an area where we actually agree. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, Wolf, how's the loss of cultural Christianity going for you? How much effort and time do you and your Christian friends devote to protecting yourselves and your children and grandchildren? How much space in your church bookshop is taken up with resources to resist the evil in modern secular life? The absence of cultural Christianity has brought hostility, not neutrality. Okay. I, um, how is it? How's it going for you? I, I was never promised it's going to go well in this life. So the, all right. So right there, he's actually quoting me. He's quoting my book. That's in my chapter on uh, cultural Christianity, and um, yeah, I'm saying one of my one of my arguments was that like look around you. Like would if you're older than me, if you're 50 or 60, yeah, I mean 70s, 80s, and 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 we're bad. But that was also located in places like California excuse me and and the bigger cities and so you most likely grew up in a decent place where there's your i i grew up in california and my street was a full of a bunch of decent folks who were not trying to trans or there's no talk of gayness or, i mean some people were more like i guess liberal but i mean bill clinton in the in the 90s bill clinton the 90s just wanted higher taxes i mean there's more than that of course but like just in hindsight, like reflect on Bill Clinton's presidency and you're like, yeah, of course, like the Oval Office stuff was bad. But in terms of policy, it wasn't horrible. In fact, the left despises Bill Clinton because he did like welfare reform. He did criminal justice reform. Um, I think he raised capital gains tax, but whatever. I mean, it's it, it just like reflect back on the politics and you listen to Rush in Rush Limbaugh. Um, in the 90s, and it's about how George or uh, Bill Clinton is a communist or a socialist because they want higher taxes 
or CNN is, is Communist News Network because they want to hire taxes. I mean, I, there's other stuff going on too. I'm not trying to like downplay that, but but it's just, but now we live in, yeah, how's it going? Like how is how is their, um, their assumptions about neutral world, how has it turned out? It's turned out into a disaster. And then he says here, we're not pro <clears throat> promised not, we're not, we're not promised that there won't be suffering. There's no promise that there'll be no suffering for a Christian. I don't know why that contradicts anything I said. As I said in my previous videos, like we have powers ordained of God for our good. Um, and those powers are designed to alleviate suffering. So yes, there is a way in which suffering, which is suffering in itself is a sort of evil, that evil can be used for good. Absolutely, right? To, it is not good to suffer and yet there in itself, and yet there is good that can arise from it. If suffering was an unqualified good, then you ought to pursue suffering. You ought to pursue to suffer. More than that, if suffering is an unqualified good, then you ought to pray for your Christian brothers and sisters to suffer. Like we pray so that people, the Christians in North, uh, North Korea and China, um, elsewhere in the world, we pray for people in Ukraine and Russia. We've prayed for them to not be persecuted, that they can live in peace and harmony, that they can worship God undisturbed and unmolested. What are we asking? We're asking for them not to suffer. So again, if suffering is an unqualified good, then we ought to actually pray for their good, which means requesting God that, that they would they would suffer. Or the same thing to us. But since suffering is only is a qualified good, that it's can be it's used by God for our good, we use the powers ordained to us, these are the earthly powers, um, to seek to alleviate the suffering. That's why we do politics. So if there is, again, I mentioned before, like Presbyterians tend to have this, like, uh, you know, we not so much we have it together, but they tend to be kind of exceptional Christians in terms of their sense of, uh, of the world and their, their ability to kind of avoid things. They have their private schools, right? Um, they usually have more money, like Presbyterians in terms of class, like Anglicans and Presbyterians tend to have, tend to be more middle, upper class. Baptists tend to be lower class in terms of socioeconomic status. Um, and so we tend to think, oh, we have it together. But then what about, again, what about the neighbor who, you know, he's baptized, walked down the aisle when he was 12 years old, never went back to church. He'll say he's a born again Christian. He's a cultural Christian, decent guy. He has kids, doesn't know any better, just let them let the kids be on the phone, let their kids watch television all day, doesn't know any better. And those are average people. Like those are the average people who are not gonna walk into your Presbyterian church, unfortunately, right? They're not gonna do that. So how do we love our neighbor? Like if if we are, you know, we can we can endure the suffering because we have money and look at all the I was gonna talk about Chris's setup there. You have no idea how much money that setup cost. I mean, the speaker behind him, I have one of those speakers, the Marshall speaker. That one I think is like a 300 and something dollar speaker. So, okay, I, <laughs> I'll get into that probably a little later. But um, but what about that that person next door who's kind of a, the nominal Christian? Don't we have any obligation? Yeah, we could say they're not true Christians, but they are closer to God than your, than your Hindu neighbor. They're closer to God than your Muslim neighbor. Now they they could certainly be, become a Christian like that. I'm not doubting that, but in terms of like closeness to God, hey man, you were baptized when you're 12. You, you, God's calling you to faithfulness. Like you need to be, you need to repent and believe. And you know, as a Presbyterian, you need to kind of live up to you need to live up to, to the baptism of your of your childhood. You call them to covenant faithfulness in that sense. So anyway, how do you love these people who are like that? Well, you do that through political power, through that through through social power. Um, and, uh, so again, I, I just don't understand like that the whole suffering argument just doesn't work on several levels. It means that, yeah, you're, uh, requesting suffering for yourself, for your friends, or you're failing to alleviate the suffering of your neighbor. Even when you have it all together, have a lot of money, send your kids to private school, your neighbor probably cannot do that. Premises here deeply trouble me as if these things, these things in, I'm going to come back to suffering in a minute, but, no, but think about this. This is. Coming back to Moscow, you guys are in red state Moscow, yeah. red state Idaho, you know. Um, you, you've said, Doug, Escondido needs a shot 
well, won't say where, but y- you've said this um, about us. Okay. Um, Escondido gets pegged. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Um, right. Here I sit in a blue state. Here I sit with lots of tax collectors and centers around me. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you don't have tax collectors and centers. And yeah, we do. You understand yeah. that. Um, you know, when I made the call, when I took the call to come here years ago, I left the sort of Christendom project in, in the town I was in, where the whole thing ostensibly had reformed churches everywhere, kind of Barnhouse's ideal city. Everyone, mm-hmm. Everyone's in church on Sunday. Blue Laws, when I first got there, still existed. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone morally upright, okay, everyone, I guess, seemed happy. I was really struggling when I came back to California because I thought, do I really want to go back to that mess? Mm-hmm. Sometimes I feel like you guys are chucking them from the... So, that probably most of you guys watching would love to live where, where he just, what he just talked about. But, but wouldn't you love to, people are morally upright. There's a lot of reformed churches. The kids speak the same broad theological language or Christian language. There's expectations there. There, in in that sort of environment, you have rich and you have poor, and you have the rich who can now help the poor because they're all part of the same sort of Christian culture. That means you can guard, safeguard their kids. It's just that I mean, no offense, but there is like a, a it tends to be like lower classes who tend to commit more crimes, have more certain degeneracy. Of course, there's vices on the upper class, so uh, and certainly middle class as well. But um, people who are in jail tend to be poor. Um, but when you have like this is what this is like what Winthrop was saying in his um, uh, sermon on Christian charity from from the old um, from the uh, from you know 17th century that famous what is it called sermon of, I can't think of it right now. Uh, but uh, the rich and the poor would work to, would 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 support one another in this effort, this combined project of a, a Christian society. But now he now he's in a new place. Now I, I, it just seems to me that like that should say what what created that, what sustained that. It was not only churches; it was also a way of life in that area that had to be safeguarded. Now that he, he's going to go on and say that he was called to a place in in California, and I'm not denying that people are called to go to places like that. Certainly, we need people called to go to places like that. But it just should reflect on: isn't that a good that we want to see happen? How does stuff like that happen? Yes, the gospel's gone forth, but there's also undergirded all that with a social life that is then protected and reinforced by the everyday interactions of people. And that should be that should be cherished and maintained. <laughs> here I am. Here I am. I decided to come back to this place. Bad taxes. I can barely afford to live. Um, I, I'm subject to all kinds of things. My children are sitting here and, you know, I don't see this on the ground in my neighborhood. Right. So, okay, that's another factor to this that, you know, we have a lot of elites pushing stuff in institutional systems and power, pushing power that way. Um, our constitution, you know, I think, I think, um, what's his name? Al Smith makes a great case that, um, the disestablishment of the constitution did not assume, uh, a sort of secularism by the framers, but that actually they knew that through institutions, things would remain Christian. That's his thesis. So, okay. That being said, what we have is an institutional problem. Get it. I have a Christian school here in Escondido. Um, when I left Linden, Washington, I did not want to come. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was scared to death. And a pastor said to me, I said, it's safe here. He said, yeah, riding your bike. Right. It's not safe spiritually. So what do you mean? Mm-hmm. It is not safe here spiritually. This was the most Christianized town I'd ever seen. It whips Moscow, by the way. And um, I come, I come back here into pagan land, and my kids have flourished. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't have this panic now. Granted, I have a community. We build a community. It's a wonderful community. But I'm not in this panic mode, and I think this is the kind of perspective Christians need to have through this. I, I realize that you've granted this to me. <laughs> All right, so I, I don't know Chris's situation. He says he can barely afford to live. I, um, as someone who has dabbled, at least lately, in um, studio equipment, I, I'm looking. I, I don't know. I'm guessing this is his studio thing. He's got 
he's got three cameras, okay, which means he has three lenses. They look like decent cameras, which means that's a lot, thousands of dollars. Maybe he rented them, so maybe he rents, but you know. Um, that means he's got three different microphones that cost at least four or five hundred dollars. They're DSLR, which means it, or they're, 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 they're connected to an interface, which costs a lot of money. Someone's done post production. It looks great, sounds great. Huge production value, a lot of money. The speaker behind him is 300 something dollars. Now, I, my, I, so I don't know like his financial situation, but all, all I'm saying is again, this, there's a Presbyterian thing. We're middle, we're upper middle class folks. We have it, we have our Christian school. We have our little bubble and we're just doing fine. I mean, you're, if you're in Escadito, it's like surrounded by a, um, uh, you know, it's got a, the seminary. A lot of people stay local to the seminary. Um, usually there's stronger, like there's larger churches in the area around a seminary. There's usually, you know, famous seminary professors who are also ministers and you go to that. So it's, you know, kind of the, a, a community develops, but it's, it's Presbyterian. So it's, it's kind of insulated. Um, and it's usually has more money. And, uh, but I, I just don't like contrast with that, where he came from, where he says like, it's spiritually dangerous, which I, I would doubt. I understand what I understand. There is the, the downs, there is a, there's a, um, there isn't, there is a downside to cultural Christianity, which I acknowledge in the book. Um, but the thing, but it's, in that society, like he said, everyone's moral and decent. Everyone can, kids can ride their bikes around their neighborhoods and, and go miles around and know people. And it's kind of like my, my childhood was a lot like that. We weren't rich. I, I, my, my, my mom was amazing and she struggled to make amazing childhood for me. So, um, and, and my dad as well. But, but you know, you kind of have that. And, and now I don't, it sounds like he doesn't really have that anymore. He kind of has a little Presbyterian community, whatever. Um, but wouldn't it be better to have a place where your, your neighbor who would be kind of a nominal Christian and now is their, their kids are now socialized into decency. Um, and I think that the, 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 the call for true Christians in a context of cultural Christianity is to is to be in a way missionaries for the gospel to people who think they're Christians, and you just say, "Look, you are in a Christian. You know, you need to um, put your you know your true faith in Christ. You need to worship God and in, in church." Um, and uh, so that there's a sort of call to to faithfulness, as I've said before. Um, and th that seems to me to be loving y your neighbor. So I, I uh, and I don't know. It, it's it's uh anyway i'll just keep going let's keep going here. you said you you agree with me on this but i think this is important to note um we have a calling in this life um in our mission as christians in the culture and our calling to be witnesses to the ends of the earth with the gospel i don't i think this rhetoric is not helping our mission that's what i'm going to come back to at the end but that's just an initial comment just to kind of respond to what you're saying right we don't believe that every christian is called to the same spot or to the same station. So, um, God's calling you here and you flourished here. God bless you. Um, there, God calls some Christians to flee California, move to Texas. God calls uh, some people to minister in Idaho. He calls some people to, to minister in complacent Dutch reformed towns, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where they need to be shook up. Mm -hmm. right? so the, the, if God calls him, um, someone to minister any particular place, he's going to have to play the ball as it lays. So when you come to pagan world, pagan world, you're going to have to approach the problem very differently mm -hmm. uh, than someone who is in a nominal Christian land, um, where the like if you go back to Kuiper's Day, Van Prinster and Kuiper in the Netherlands, uh, a lot of a lot of the Dutch fled to America because they weren't allowed to build evangelical Christian schools by the Reformed Christian government. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so they, um, they were persecuted by fellow Reformed. Christians. And so they fled to America. So there's always, there's always somebody up to something. And, and whenever you, if you have Christian consensus, when you enroll in a math class, you're going to have math problems. When you have lots of Christians, you're going to have lots of Christians problem problems. When you have a lot of pagans, you're going to have a lot of pagan problems. God calls us to different stations, duty stations. And just one other point of like unity on this. It's very, as you talked about, you come to California, it's a liberal place. 
And you mentioned, but you built quite a community here, and that's evident just kind of looking around. I can't help. So you but can't see. criticize Escondido too much. Well, <laughs> we're only returning fire. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help but uh, look at parallels, right? So um, Moscow is obviously a very blue dot in the midst of a red state. So, but it's very blue. Um, of my five neighbors, four of them have LGBTQ signs in the yard, right, right, right in front of the yard. Doug can't walk down Main Street without getting cussed out and like inflict off. So there, there's like, but what's happened is we built, there's quite a community that's built up and it's very similar. I mean, it's the way the church always is. I just mark that as a point of unity. There will always be, um, the people of God, a, a Goshen like blessing of God amidst, you know, a darkness. Maybe the question, maybe the, the, the debate or the, the difference is thinking about how, who's going to kind of push against who and who's going to win o- overall. But I just point out there, there is actually a similarity. Fair enough. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I think I'm going to move down. Maybe this will come back, but you know, I think it was Gabe interviewing Paul Miller was talking about, Oh, I think it was. Um, yeah. I'll say something about, I, I've been spent a few days in Moscow. I was very impressed by everyone there. Um, and uh, w- w- it's one thing I'm impressed by the CREC churches is they do have a, a type of embattled mentality. And they see their churches as not only a worshiping body, but also a a, a network of mutual support. So I've uh, the CREC church near me, up near Cary, um, is very much like that. And uh, I, I can uh, I I appreciate that they have a sense of a sense of mission. That this is like they are a type of um, yeah, like they are a, uh, an embattled in a, in a way an embattled community, and they help each other out. And I think that's what we have to, we're gonna have to need we're gonna need going forward. Um, you know, b- business. If if uh, like uh, if you own a business, you would bring one of those young guys in as an employee, and then he's he's safe and secure, building skills. He can kind of say what he wants. Um, he can be a, a Christian in the workplace and not have to kind of bite his tongue when they go through the, the diversity training. Um, you know, the DEI train and all that. So I, I think that there definitely is something going on that's great within CREC in that regard. It was about a situation San, in that. San Francisco. Don't you want God's, uh, don't you want society ruled according to God's law? I think that's the sort of fallacy of false dilemma that I, I worry about. Um, I think it's important just for me to say, I'm not going to, I don't want to get into big, we're going to come back to this again, but I want to say this, that it is important that we believe that society, because there is a moral law of God that society itself, Christians, as they exercise being Christians and influencing institutions and uh, influencing people with their convictions, we we want society ordered morally. I think I want I want to say that because I don't. I think sometimes, at least from the Escondido side, you know, David Van Jernan, uh, uh, Kuiper Spear sovereignty, right? Um, I I believe I, I think he was brilliant. I like his spear sovereignty. I think it's important. He does say some things. I'll read here in a moment. But that spirit sovereignty each has its own place. I worry of again. I worry about the theonomic vision of postmillennialism. We're Kyperians. Okay, but you're you're theonomic. Well, and Kyperian. Yeah, that's not that's not totally consistent, Kyperian. <laughs> well, but anyways, we uh, so basically we are not card carrying Reconstructionists <coughs> from the eighties. I, I back in the eighties, I read a boatload of Rushdoony and Bonson and North and uh, others, and learned a lot from them. But I'm not a card carrying Reconstructionist. And I am, uh, I am Kyperian. So I don't believe, I don't believe in uh, a reformed version of Iran's Ayatollahs. Uh, I believe in, uh, I believe in sphere sovereignty. I believe in the Lordship of Christ overall, but I believe it is decentralized. There's separation of church and state. There are also separation of other lesser yeah. spheres, schools and whatnot. So I'm, I'm happy with the Kyperian. Label. I wouldn't agree with everything Kuiper wrote, but I'm I'm basically yeah. Well, well, unfortunately, Wolf's not. Yeah. Well, yeah. Wolf is a Thomist, and, and um, he 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 doesn't seem to grasp this the, the the importance of that separation in terms of the sovereignty of each spear. Right. That's definitely going on, and I just add here as ever. Yeah. Interesting. I'm the Thomist. Thomist. Uh, whenever I hear Thomist, I just. Uh, it's it's interesting. I, I would just say I'm just classical Protestant. <laughs> um, so, but even within like a sphere sovereignty arrangement, um, let's just uh, w- within the within the, the the church itself as an ecclesial body, um, I would affirm that they are they uh, they preach the word, 
they so essentially they they have the 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 oracles of God for eternal life. They preach the word. They administer the sacraments. They do uh, church discipline as a spiritual act. Um, they have the keys of the kingdom. So that's all within the church realm. Um, function through the sacred office of of church minister. Um, and the the principal role of the church is to is to provide the spiritual goods um, conducive to eternal life. Okay, so that's the function of the church. If we want to say that's like they're sovereign in that, meaning that the state cannot like, you know, introduce, like force you to do certain ceremonies. Um, the, the, the state, the, the, the um, civil magistrate can't step up and say, I'm going to preach this to you as if I'm a minister or as a, as a I'm going to, you know, he can't like force you to uh, stand up there and have the sort, sort of authority that a minister would have with regard to preaching. Nevertheless, you do have to have some peace and purity and unity outside of the church. Uh, so anyway, what, what, what the, the church is uh, uh, principally, principally its object is the inner man, it's the soul. Okay. Um, I think that's a good, that's a classical Protestant position that that's the, their principal role as, as an institution. I don't mean like the church as a, a body of believers, but as an institution with um, laws of Christ, uh, which are then taken up and executed by means of the sacred ministry. But now if you get in the civil realm, civil realm is uh, th they can essentially touch bodies like the, the outward man. Okay. The outward man can include anything that is e even externally expressed. Like we can, you know, we're okay with silencing someone who wants to cry fire in a theater. Um, and why is that? Well, it will call, cause harm to people. So if you want to talk about sovereignty, well, the sovereignty of the state or the, or the civil ruler or the civil prince or the Christian prince or whatever, um, is over the outward things of man. Um, and, but some things that are outward can have inward effects. Some things that are outward, um, some things that were originally inward that were expressed outwardly, let's say like a call to revolution. Like you might in your head think, well, we need to go do a violent revolution right now. We need to overthrow the government. But you can believe that in your heart all day long and the, and the civil ruler can't do anything about it because one, he doesn't know you believe it. Um, and even if he did know you believe it, he couldn't change your mind by whipping you um, because in, inward beliefs are a matter of persuasion. Uh, and so, but if you outwardly expressed, we need a violent revolution. Well, guess what? Even in, in most countries, including our own, you could actually be convicted for sedition and, and um, you know, threats of violent revolution or inciting a violent revolution. So that is an inward belief that's expressed outwardly that then can be suppressed by civil powers. All right. So in principle, then, uh, the civil ruler um, uh, seeing or like witnessing external expressions of things that are detrimental to the people of that society can then in principle suppress that. Um, I would say, so that that's just a matter of like maybe blasphemy. So blasphemy, why would blasphemy want to be suppressed by the civil ruler? Well, even apart from like the soul, um, blasphemy is undermining the very foundation of political order. I mentioned this in the previous video that even the, all the pagan societies believe that in some sense that, that divinities or the divine had to be a sort of foundation for the state. There had to be one, there had to be some kind of worship. Um, and also there, th something about the laws themselves had the, had their, um, had their force and their sort of immutability from being undergirded by some nature of divinity. And that was a part of, as, as uh, Chris would say, uh, he would say it's, um, there's common grace. I would say in a way God uses the pagan idolatry under the broad idea of, of religion as a way to restrain the vices of people in civil society. So in that sense, the civil ruler having self, having a perfect interest in maintaining public order would say, wait, public atheism is bad for public order. Public atheism asserting that, convincing people of it, or creating just a, a type of uh, um, practical atheism, which is what we have today um, in society, can actually be bad for public order, and therefore I'm going to act uh, to suppress that.
Okay, um, that would be the interest of public order. Uh, the same thing you could, you could say, well, is true religion good for civil order? Is, is practicing, acknowledging the true religion, is that going to be good for political order? Well, if that's the case, then you might say, well, I want to encourage the, the worship of God. Um, and so I'm going to, re I'm going to restrict commercial activity on Sundays. And uh, my intent there is that it would free people um, from it would prevent employers and employees and others from conducting the sort of activity that would undermine and distract people from from achieving that good, which is in itself would be a spiritual good, but has this, the effect of being a civil good. Um, even if it's even if someone is not a true Christian and they attend church, it's actually better for them for civil society that they do that. So that's why a Sabbath law um, would be beneficial to uh, society. Now, I'm not saying they have to force belief. Civil society cannot force a belief. I'm not saying the civil magistrate is preaching the word, or administering sacraments, or introducing um, sacred ceremonies in a, in a public worship. Uh, what I am saying, though, is that even within the interest of civil society itself, that magistrate has an interest in promoting true religion. Okay, um, I mean this is this is why pagans like Plato in his book The Laws. I mentioned this before that he wanted to punish atheism. And why? Well, because if everyone's an atheist, no one will obey the laws. It'll be, it'll be chaos and anarchy. Uh, and so that was, that was his argument. And then similar, similarly, you see this in Cicero. Cicero says explicitly that like religion, religion is the foundation of good order and, uh, good order and discipline in the civil sphere. Again, that's common grace, the sort of thing that, uh, Chris keeps mentioning. Um, again, even pagan religion could be used by God, despite its idolatry and its falsity, could be used by God via common grace to shore up a society, though, of course, that often would introduce false. It's more to say about that. But so even within like a, a, a sphere sovereignty, I don't usually use that language, but in a sphere sovereignty context, you could say that um, the one sphere has an interest in the sort of things that would be more properly exercised or are properly exercised within the ecclesial sphere, um, just like the ecclesial sphere has an interest in, I mean, I would say they have interest in Sabbath laws. I mean, at the very base, the, at the very foundation, like, or the very basic level, a church has an interest in the civil magistrate uh, maintaining good public order because only with good public order can then the church you know, ordinarily speaking, worship God rightly, unmolested, undisturbed. Um, right. So there is a mutual supporting aspect. The 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 the, the church minister will um, will uh, preach essentially civil obedience to good laws. Um, they could even discipline someone for for like a gross violation of the law. Let's say they commit fraud. I think ordinarily that they commit fraud, then that would be an action of, of the church, one for the spiritual benefit, but also to repent and to um, ensure the discipline of the church. That benefits the state or the civil sphere. Similarly, the civil, the civil sphere can then mutually support the ecclesial sphere, not by doing the things I mentioned, but by doing the sort of things outwardly that conduce to that. Um, we, we do this, this is, shouldn't be foreign to us. We do this, this kind of thing at the individual level. Um, when we go to church on Sunday, um, if you're Protestant, you most likely have a nice breakfast in the morning. You're going to drink some coffee. Maybe you drink coffee with you. Maybe you get, you put on a nice dress or a nice uh, suit or something like that, or a woman wears a dress, um, uh, whatever. You make sure there's gas in the car on Saturday, what, whatever it is, you do things outwardly um, that prepare you for worship. You don't want to be in the middle of church and suddenly be starving or be utterly of, of thirst, all you can think about is that, that next drink of water um, or, or whatever it is, right? So we do things for the body to aid the activity of the soul in church. The same thing would be true of the body politic, that the civil magistrate or the civil ruler, he can only touch and affect the outward man, and yet the outward man is a support for the inward man. Uh, the the outward body politic is a support for the inward um, uh, the, the inner body politic uh, and so um, th this again this is just classical reformed this is even like Roman Catholic stuff I mean there's differences there but this is just basic stuff um, and I, I think the Kuyperian 
Again, like I, Kuiper, I don't think Kuiper would agree would disagree with that. Any of that. Um, there is like this. This is why I don't like the sovereignty language because it it depends on what you mean by sovereignty. Sovereignty over the inward man as a direct action. That's the church. Sovereignty over the outward man, principally as a direct action. That's the that's the civil state. But again, as I've said, you you don't want to separate the inner and the outer. You can't separate the inner and the outer. We're not like these dualistic beings such that the body has no relation to the soul or the soul has no relation to the body. Um, and so the, the civil magistrate as in charge of the body politic should act within its power um, and within prudence given the circumstances to arrange the outward such that it conduces to the inward. Again, you do that for your family, I assume, on Saturday uh, or through the week. You do that with your own person um, throughout on Saturday, Sunday morning. Um, and so I think also the body politic. All right, let's keep going. This gaming out the positions and, and Wolf and the, that crew is also nowhere near a card carrying reconstructionist the, theonomous. They're, they're very, they're very opposed to the card carrying reconstruction theonomist. So there's just a lot going on. And that's part of what I meant by this, this movement has not cohered is it's not taken shape yet. So there are, um, we're not at war with each other, but there are differences and debates and discussions. And what Stephen Wolf does, wants to do is return to sort of the magisterial reformed political theory, um, Al Althusius and those guys. Um, and I think that basically theonomy, if you imposed theonomy and then added 500 years of lived experience, you would have Althusius. So I'm, I'm not a full tilt reconstructionist theonomist. I'm not a full tilt, um, uh, I'm not a Thomist at all. Yeah, and a lot uh, of a lot of people are well, hardcore theonomists aren't real happy with you. So. Right. I, I, um, you know. So, <laughs> so, so Robert, we are right in the juicy middle, right in the okay. the right the right position. If we stand on the yellow line, <laughs> yeah. extremism is to our right and left. I understand. <laughs> Truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, okay, I just want to raise this. I know. So I would I would say that yeah, I don't think Doug and I are at war uh, either. I, I don't think that we're actually as far apart on the theonomy issue as people might suppose. I, I'm not adamantly opposed to theonomy. Um, I'm I, I disagree with the some of the uh, some of the principles behind some versions of theonomy. Uh, I think I, I would take like Franciscus Junius's view, which many people would call kind of theonomic, in the sense that, that he thinks that that um that the that civil punishments in the old testament excuse me that that the the more severe punishments of the old testament um so the ones that require death are, are ordinarily almost like essential to have in a christian state or a christian republic um and that's not not simply because it, it's because in part because god ordained it but also because the fact that the, the severity of the punishment points to the severity of, of the sin and the crime, uh, it points to the severity of the sin, which means that the punishment for the crime um, ought to be severe enough to seriously suppress the sin or and the crime, you know? So yes, it should, yeah, it should be to suppress the sin. And why is that? Because the sin is, is grievous enough that, that it would harm civil society broadly. Now I wouldn't say like, you know, let's take all the civil punishments, those were damned by God and now just like enact it. Um, so I, I don't think like there's a huge difference and I wish like Theonis would get off my back for, <laughs> for things that um, I, I just, the, uh, um, but anyway, I, I, I don't think that all of our laws is just us and just me and natural law reflecting on on myself and it, and somehow that's it's a lot more complicated. I think I think law itself is a combination of of reason about human nature. It's about experience. That is what laws have worked in our society and their society or other people's societies. Um, what body of law has been effective and ineffective. And then scripture as well, informing the the moral principles and also the application, the, the divine application of those principles. But um, all of that should be done in consideration of the of the of the facts on the ground. So, is a is this law actually going to conduce to good, or is it going to conduce to to evil in effect? So, a, a, a law can be good in itself. Um, like a, like like a, like a, I, I think like a, a law that suppresses heresy 
would be good, is good in itself. But if that were introduced to in our society now, it would end up being so ineffective and embarrassing it wouldn't work and it would probably cause more evil than good. And so I would not be in favor of introducing a heresy law, um, you know, for the fact of the matter that it would it wouldn't be obeyed. Um, there'd be an outcry, outrage, all that sort of thing. It, in the end, it wouldn't be effective. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't. Again, I don't think there's a huge difference between us. I think people in in the the kind of the post-war Calvinist world, they get spooked when you hear natural law, and they don't really know what that means. When I say natural law, I mean first of all that it fits well. It fits into my system of politics, mainly meaning that the um, that politics fundamentally is is trying to enact the good in society that's that good is grounded in human nature and that human nature is essentially uh, there's a law suitable to that nature and so that's the natural law and so the so any uh, a good law is essentially is fundamentally an application of natural law but what can inform us on what a good law is or whether a law is good or bad is not simply philosophy, but also scripture. Scripture, is, the Ten Commandments, is a summary of the Ten Commandments, as a summary of the moral law. The moral law is the natural law. And so when you apply the Ten Commandments properly, you are in effect applying the natural law. So you're applying the Ten Commandments via faith because God said it's true, therefore it's true because God, everything God says is true. Therefore you're applying that. Um, and if you apply it properly, then you're actually in effect applying the natural law. And in fact, the very foundation of the Ten Commandments is the natural law. Um, but again, you know the natural law via, by, by faith, um, upon reflection on scripture itself. So, um, so the, the natural law just again fits into my overall system of thought, which really the, my main concern there is to say that whatever, whatever is good for us is also good, is good for us because it, like when we, when we do good, when we act in a good way, when we are doing good, we are actually being human. We're being fully human. Right? It's not as if the, the, there's a divine law that we're just sort of like neutral matter and meaningless matter. And then God uh, kind of um, uh, brought a law down and now we ought to just conform to that law. No, it's that we were born with a nature. That nature has a good. There's a, there's a good to that nature. There's a good to human nature. And that good is the fulfillment us being perfectly good is us fulfilling that law that and that law is essentially inheres and is suitable to us right so when then when we act we're not just we're not only obeying god when we act for the good we are in a way acting as we ought to as human beings um and so that but that again that doesn't preclude scripture from informing what that good is because scripture is an inscripturated form of of uh, of the good so by natural law you come to deduct it from from reason uh what is good from reason from scripture god says this is good and you you trust that is true because god is true so anyway i don't think there's a huge difference between us on that um i think anyway and, and again I, I i i've talked to theonomists i've talked to others about this and i think there's a lot of overlap um so I actually think a lot more of the differences arise from a version of postmillennialism. Um, not all postmill people, but I think there's a version of postmillennialism that wants to, in a way, escape politics. You know, there's going to be enough conversions out there, and when we get enough conversions, then things will just happen. Like you know, the the political society will just happen. It just happens. There's no clearly identified mechanism of how that happens, like on the ground. Um, and and so th there's there's a way that in a way like the, the the spreading of the gospel means that we can transcend political life like the i mean the, the actual doing politics as we've known it um so and this is one reason why some post mill guys don't like it when i when i when i talk about aristotle or socrates or plato um, or cicero like they don't like that because i'm i'm tapping into a wealth of experience and wisdom on the good from people who are virtuous pagans in my mind. And I'm using that to apply to politics. 
because I don't, because I think that we're never going to escape politics and that we can learn things from them because we fundamentally share the same type of political life as Cicero and Aristotle and Plato. The same perennial questions are going to drive us to need to act and arrange ourselves properly. And I don't think we're ever going to escape that. And so I, I suspect that some post mill people um, basically want to kind of escape that. Um, not everyone, I, probably even like the majority. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I just suspect that's part of the reason why I, I get pushed back. Not, not the theonomy, it's the post mill. You know, in light of the concern that I've raised about the behavior of a lot of the movement right now, especially I think even Wolf's behavior to some degree, as I read, read him, you know, he's even talked about, he was on the, um, Crespi cast talking about situations to, you know, kill heretics to have the magistrate put them to death. But anyways, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> funny how that my behavior on that, on that episode, <laughs> the funny thing is like everyone told me that my behavior was good and everyone else's was bad. Um, and I, I never said on that, on the Presby cast that, that we should kill heretics. My only argument was that it's not wrong in principle. Now, something can be permitted in principle, but in most cases, inappropriate. I mean, we can think of things like this. I mean, it's so in our society, like I said earlier, you can't do I think in principle, it's fine because someone who's in, in gross heresy in a certain society um, can seriously influence people and damage their soul. And so you suppress it. And, you, and of course, you should go through the normal reform process, which even Calvin did with Servetus, which was that you appeal to them and, and essentially try to persuade them out of it for a long time. The ministers go forth, go, go forth first to persuade. I mean, first the minute, first the civil magistrate says, no, stop it. Then the, then the church minister goes in and says, we're going to reform, you know, we're going to persuade you out of it. If they persist and they persist to try to, to harm the souls of people, um, then I think it's, it's fair, uh, that they can be, you know, banished and other things. Now, again, that, there's conditions for that. One, is it actually going to conduce to good in society? And the other thing, does it fit the constitutional parameters established for the state to act? So I think in, if you're in a constitutional system and you are elected in that system and that system says in some effect, you are, you are not allowed to punish heresy, then you shouldn't punish heresy because you are bet you're elected in a system and so like in, like in our uh, our system we have um you know the first amendment that constrains congress now you might have a major majority majority presbyterians in congress and they really want to pass some sort of uh, i don't know the some sort of new covenant with the nation and make everything presbyterian well they're bound by the first amendment being in congress and so it would it wouldn't be wrong in itself, it would be wrong because it violates the established order that is that is that has been established by the people to constrain power. Um, so in our system, it wouldn't be appropriate if there was like a constitutional amendment that said, you know, the states could do it or whatever. Um, then that's different. But uh, so I think this is just a, it's a, a why like misunderstanding. If you read the book carefully enough, I say this over and over and over that sometimes some, some things are, are less appropriate than others. Um, my only regret, um, or one of my regrets from the book is not talking enough about constitutionalism. And that would, if I, if I ever get to revise it again, I, I'll probably in the Christian Prince chapter, or maybe do like a part two where I con I talk about power in relation to constitutionalism, um, which I think is something I neglected to do. Um, but, uh, yeah. I think one of the things that helps us in this regard is the terrible attitude, not helps us, but that concerns me is the terrible attitude toward governing situations that we've had. I understand there's a terrible attitude towards secularism, but again, as we've distinguished here, common grace is very important in this. And if you've already admitted, Doug, that yes, they can be legitimate. Joe Biden is the president. <laughs> okay. From God, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the, the way that I hear the discourse. God from, put him there. The American people didn't. Okay. <laughs> all, right. all right. Now we've gotten down to business. <laughs> okay. All right. So first is the, the fruit of the bad fruit of the movement. Just one more point on the bad fruit since I have, because I think other people will be listening to this and I want those crazies to hear this. Okay. I'm not calling you a crazy, but <laughs> the bad fruit here, the whole point of second Peter is that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of oppressive situations. Mm-hmm. 
I'm not sure that's understood or appreciated at our, our current moment. It speaks of false teachers as people, I was struck by this the other day when I was reading it, as those who despise authority. Mm-hmm. And false teachers, one of their hallmarks is despising authority. They're not afraid of speaking evil of dignitaries. Mm-hmm. Whereas angels, who are greater in power and might, did not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Jude says the same thing. They reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending against the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, did not bring a reviling accusation, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael wouldn't even bring a reviling accusation against Satan. Against the devil. Okay. Um, Angels won't do this to dignitaries. I just want to read Calvin on this. Okay. Hence, he shows their rash arrogance, because they dared to assume more liberty than even angels. Mm-hmm. This is our whole, uh, this is one of my great concerns of Christian nationalism at the moment. It seems strange that he says angels do not bring a railing accusation against magistrates, but we consider the circumstances of the time, what is said applies very suitably to holy angels, for all the magistrates then were ungodly and bloody enemies to the gospel. Um, Wolf might want to check some of his uh, <laughs> recovery and do some reading on this point from Calvin. Um, this is fascinating. He, however, says that men deserving hatred and execration were not condemned by them in order that they might show respect to a power divinely appointed. While such, with such, while such moderation, he says, is shown by angels, these men fearlessly give vent to impious and unbridled blasphemies. Michael dared not speak more severely against Satan, though a reprobate and condemned, than to deliver him to God to be restrained. But these men hesitated not to load with extreme reproaches the powers which God had adorned with peculiar honors. Now these, with bold effrontery, vomited forth reproaches against magistrates, that they might take away respect for public rights. And this was openly to fight against God by their blasphemies. There are also many turbulent men of this sort at the present day, who proudly declare that the power of the sword is heathen and unlawful, and furiously attempt to subvert all government. Such fury Satan excites in order to disturb and prevent the progress of the gospel. Now, my friends, that's my great concern here. I don't know. I I don't know what he's talking about with regard to me. Calvin's talking about Anabaptists and and uh and and, and later that might apply also to Covenanters. Um so I, I don't know what what Chris is talking about with I, I um What's weird is I I rarely talk about every day to day politics. I rarely talk about Biden. I don't think I've ever posted anything that said anything about Biden's like uh, mental awareness or shared it. I don't do any of that stuff. Uh, I think it's something worth talking about, but I don't remember ever reviling pagan authority uh, or you know um, uh, Biden's authority or anyone's authority. Um, as a political guy, I'd criticize certain people. Um, I never denied that that even like pagan leaders or non-Christian leaders or who are the, of uh, of you know a legitimate that, that they have a legitimate power. So I don't know. I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, I I never did any of that sort of thing. I, I explicitly say in the book that even a non-Christian holds legitimate power. I say that even a even a civil even a civil magistrate who um who is uh is doing tyrannical acts like he's he's a um not necessarily a tyrant well even a tyrant um but i'll just say one who's doing things that are that that are um ordering you to do something you ought not do per the law of god you still you disobey the command because you obey god not men but you can still in that disobedience recognize the authority in a formal sense of the man who ordered it it's like um it's like if you're in the military and your your commanding officer orders you to go do something that's immoral you could say sir that's immoral i refuse the order that that you ought to do that you ought to refuse an immoral act but when you do that you don't say sir you're no longer my superior commander I'm going to throw, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, overthrow your command. And I'm going to take over. You don't have to, you don't have that, like disobeying one order does not mean you are, you have to then destroy or, or to, um, uh, th- that you, that you can disrespect the office um, or even view the guy as an illegitimate um, wielder of power. Now, 
If someone's a usurper, that's a different question. Usurper basically means or they've seized the power that they don't have legitimately, and therefore they cannot command you because they don't actually have legitimate authority. Um, I never said anything about like whether or not Joe Biden won or didn't win or whatever. Um, to my mind, Joe Biden is the president, uh, at, at the very least, by the common sense of the consent of the people, regardless of how you view the election results. And so, um, yeah, he has the authority. He has the authority of God. Nevertheless, when he commands something that is evil, you disobey. Um, and at the same time, you say, no, sir, I'm not going to do it. Or you say, Mr. President, I um, am not going to obey that order. I've never said anything different, so I don't know where Chris is getting at that. He did say, uh, to his Chris's defense, I guess, he did say that afterwards, he did feel like he went after me un, um, uh, unfairly. So perhaps this is one of those moments where he did, but... Uh, yeah. I, I see this all the time in this <laughs> movement. And I, I believe, Doug, I believe since you're a spearhead, you have a responsibility, just like I have a responsibility to speak to these things and calm these people down instead of blowtorch things. So, yeah. so, so the, that's, that's Anabaptism. And my, they were, they took over Munster in the 1530s and throughout the government. That's what we're seeing in Christian nationalism are Anabaptist tendencies to the extreme. No, <laughs> no, no. I, uh, I've never seen, I mean, th there might be some like Christian nationalists on my side who have kind of reflected on whether or not rebellion, like an active revolution would be justified. Um, I mean, our, our American founding was, was a, a revolution. Um, we, we said, uh, no, thank you, King. And we're going to be our own, own people now. Uh, and we fought a war for it. Um, now you could say that's good or bad. I, I don't know, but I, I think some people it's, it is ironic though, that a lot of the, like go back to the founding people are also very critical. Of the fact that I wrote an, I wrote a, a chapter that, that essentially justified what happened in the American founding or the Re American revolution. So there was more to it than that, but like. It's it's weird. I, I uh, it's uh, it actually kind of offends me that I'm called an Anabaptist. I don't think I've ever been called that before. <laughs> but. Right. Well, a couple. Of First, let me say at the core of this, I agree with you. Uh, one of the formative moments in my boyhood. Seriously, I still vividly remember it. I don't know I what Doug agrees Southern with. Baptist here. Church. I'm confused. And at like, Sunday school, we learned we learned the song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Yeah. And then I remember that one in the Reformed Church. All right. And then. Uh, but the, our teacher taught us a, a verse that said, if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on a tack owl, sit on a tack owl. And we came home singing that and got rebuked by my father. <laughs> and this is, this is when I learned about the verse in, in Jude. Um, you, you don't talk, you don't even talk about the devil that way. Uh, so I never hear anyone raise this point. Well, I, I can, I can tell you that I know that there are hotheads in the movement that I'm associated with. And I can assure you that I have been doing my level best to deal with the hotheads, to speak to the hotheads, to, um, so I'm, I'm completely, I'm, I'm with you. All right. So that, that's the first thing. I'm not pushing back against the point at all, but the wonderful point that Calvin made, which I, with which I agree, he, he could have sent that with maybe some, um, uh, spiritual edification to Luther's cartoonists, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, the cartoons of the devil defecating in the Pope's hat. Um, there was, it's not just Anabaptists. Right. <laughs> okay. Luther, you get a few beers into Luther. I understand. <laughs> okay. I, I, I've read enough Luther to know. <laughs> or Calvin. Uh, I mean, turn Calvin on the Papists. And, right, right. and so there, there's some, there's some, um, they, they know how to, I think there's a fundamental commitment that Christians, Christian combatants have to have and a commitment to hit above the belt. And to remember that you you have to fight, you have to do everything you do as a Christian under authority. And those passages you read are part of our marching orders. Uh, we we must love our enemies. We must, if I were if I were put in a position to meet Joe Biden, I'd address him as Mr. President. I would mm -hmm. you know I'd want to speak to him, honoring the office that God has bestowed on him. All of those things are true, and I don't want to participate in the cafeteria food fight that characterizes so much online discussion where everything just devolves into name calling and trolling and that sort of thing. That's, now, that's Doug, you know what someone might respond with. Yeah, I know what they might respond with. Okay. <laughs> and, and they say, might go to Denny Burke and read all of the catalog of things that you said. That's right. That and then are, would, are yes, utterly but, and, shocking. And then I no, then I would urge them to go to my response to Denny Burke 
for a very careful, uh, here's the, here's the important thing. People can assume when they read something spicy that I write that I'm just, I, you know, I can't help myself. It's a personality thing. It's a weapon in the armory that we pick up when we think we need it. It's a tool in the tool chest that we use. Yeah, I know that's your position. Uh, no, but, that's the position. Yeah, right. but. You were going to say something. Yes, let me just, just uh, kind of follow just that yeah, real quick. Yeah. But you guys, oh, how I love thy law, oh, Lord. Mm -hmm. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. That's the law of God. Yeah. Define and that, that, that also means writing. <laughs> also, yeah, that's correct. correct. Right. It also means Isaiah. It also means Ezekiel. It also means the pattern that the word of God itself gives us. So, um, I, I can't have. Yeah, wholesome. you're a little bit outside uh, the pattern. I, I, I don't have a, no, I don't have no, a lot to say about that's all this a, that's stuff. That's the point. I'm, um, I'm outside of my Victorian great grandmother's. <laughs> I am outside to, that. Just, that's, just, that's, so I, there's this. several things. <laughs> I, 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 can, I can only do like perspective here. <laughs> yeah. So you know, um, there's uh, Doug said a few things on this that I think are worthy of note. One, Doug says, just so everybody knows, I don't choose like to sin when I write these words and then you know ask forgiveness. I believe I'm just and following that law. So he believes he's very much in that law and he's cited and defended it and you can read the serrated edge and all of that the other thing that's very interesting well this is just a personal testimony since you brought both of us this um doug is a remarkably self-controlled human being i work right next to the office and i've actually um yeah just like not luther at all in the slightest <laughs> um but then the other thing that was very helpful i think this was in your denny burke response you said i do occasionally you know use a hot pepper to get the point across, right? We make a whole dish and there's a hot pepper and I have a reason for doing so and I think I have biblical justification for doing so. But what so-and-so did when he got all of my quotes and put them all in one article from like years and years of writing is he took he took all of the peppers, he brought them all together, he put them on a Triscuit and served it to your mom sure. so that she wouldn't listen to Nancy's blog. <laughs> that's, don't you think, don't now, you, that's exactly what happened. Don't you like think though, Jared, being, listen, I'm not trying to be pietistic rambling babbler here uh, that stands you know, above, above you guys as a, as a more holy person. It's not what I'm doing. Um, but, and I don't want, I don't want to park on this too long, but the above reproach thing, especially because the fruit of it is creating these kind of warriors that I'm seeing everywhere. Um, I think somebody who has the kind of influence that you have has a responsibility to set by example in, in speaking the truth in love set by example a way that models how Christians ought to behave in the public square. That's I agree exactly. entirely. And I just want to underscore, that's, I, I think Doug is a perfect model for that kind of thing. So you're right to say, hey, you've got this voice. And I want to say, yeah, and that's why that's why um, young men that want to navigate this particular time are actually attracted to the ministry that's going on. Some of them are. Some of them are. And the people, the people online that you are worried about, I would be willing to bet you a hundred dollars. I'd be worried about also. Well, some are CREC men, uh, yeah. ministers yeah. acting. Yes. So, so, so but okay. the, the point is, if the the people that you would be worried about in their online rhetoric and off the chain stuff, mm -hmm. and I'd be worried about for the same reason, and quite possibly have spoken to them about. Um, let's just without, without betraying anything, I've sought to address those sorts of things. The people that you are thinking are following my lead are the people in my life who are the least likely to follow my lead. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, coming back to something we talked about earlier, I, I want to agree with you that there is there are cycles. I think one thing that is lost that I actually agree with you on here is the cycle of iniquity, the bestial nature of kingdoms as they ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's really important for people to remember. Um, Revelation at times presents a state in its worst form, and Christians have to in, in Remember the calling to be faithful in the midst of that. We're going to come back to theonomy and postmillennialism in a second. I keep saying this, but we've got, I want to get somewhere. So, um, but I just, I, I want you to know, I agree with the, the iniquity of the Amorites must be complete. Yeah. Um, that's an important principle in this, uh, yeah. that what we are experiencing and nations run in cycles, cycles of iniquity, churches run in cycles, um, denominations, institutions, right. the nations running in a cycle and we, have to leave that to the judgments of the Lord. Without prying into those, I understand your creative, I, I get all that, but how we conduct ourselves, what our goals and aspirations shall be. Well, Jared, I look forward in a minute to raising one of your points. So uh, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is good. All right. Persecution and suffering. So by the way, intrusion ethics is important. I don't know if you've spent any time on that, but God intervenes just like Sodom. Intervening birth pains with judgments. Mm -hmm. It's not like... Things are just willy-nilly going out of control outside, spinning out of control. Hell, you know, the sky's falling, the sky's falling, the Toby comment. Um, the, the intrusion ethics are important in this, that God intervenes in history and God does judge. I, I'm 
I fully agree with that. In your in your book, in Mere Christendom, you posed a question to kingdom to kingdoms advocates on that front. Of course, the standard is God judges, and He also judges magistrates mm-hmm. who are ungodly. Psalm eighty two, according to the principle of justice, <laughs> whether they maintain justice, even in the next statement, He says, "Even though you're blind and know nothing," right. but He still expected them Amen. to help the poor yes. and the needy. All right, Amen. Suffering and Christology and persecution. Okay, I'm going to read a statement. I'm getting warmed up. So I'm going to read a statement here. <laughs> we'll know um, when you start waving your arms. When you start waving your arms, reason. <laughs> now I'm getting fired up. It's happening. So, um, Wolf, this statement, I, I wanted to take the book and, you know, okay. It's to our shame take the book. that we sheepishly tolerate the assaults against our Christian heritage. We are dead inside, talking about Christians. Lacking the spirit to drive against the open mockery of God and claim what is ours in Christ. Well, I wanted to say up front that then even Jesus didn't pass your test. Um, wow. All right. Our heritage of faith. Let's see. Um, our heritage of faith. I'm talking to, I'm talking to Americans. So let's say... Uh, Let's say that your ancestors, no, let's start small. Let's say that your parents or your grandparents and your parents worked hard their entire life and they, um, you inherited from them a small fortune or a fortune or something like that. And uh, you see that fortune now being destroyed by marauders or by thieves um, or by a friend or by a neighbor, and you just sit back and say, well, you know, suffering is what the gospel, that's what the gospel says. We have to suffer. When you have a heritage, it's a gift. A lot of people around the world do not have a heritage of the Christian faith. You can think of places like China or the Middle East. Some people in the Middle East do. But uh, these places don't have a heritage of faith. They have no faith passed down. They have no Christian institutions passed down. They have no Christian country passed down. No, no, nothing like that. They have no churches that are around for a hundred or fifty or whatever years that people built. People put their money into, donated money to build a church so that people could worship there. And we just sit back and let the pagans destroy it all. What, what does that say? If, if your heritage is a heritage of faith and it's a gift from the effort of people, now I'm getting fired up, and it's, it, it's a gift from the effort and prayer and deliberate action of people who fall under the fifth commandment and you just, you know what, you sit back and let it get destroyed. Who are you honoring? There was just that, that um, in, what is it, in St. Paul, there's a, a church that was just bought by Muslims and they're going to turn to a mosque. I don't know. I mean, whoever sold that to them, do they honor? Are they are they honoring their the, the people who spent millions of dollars to build that beautiful church? No. Now it's given over to a false god, to false religion, false worship. Is that honoring? Is that what we just do? We just, yeah, well, sheepish. Yeah, that is sheepish. It's dishonoring the gift. This is the problem. This is one of the problems. Maybe it's an American mindset, though I'd say it's in England and everywhere. All these ancient societies have this. They don't view their their world as a gift. You were born into a social environment. You were born into a built environment. You're born into a family that most likely had some kind of money, some kind of vocation, something where they received you in and shared that stuff with you. And now you look around and th- those same things still exist. They still endure. Um, and you just, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, we're not called to protect. You know, so is it, you're allowing the gifts of your people to spoil 
out of some sort of piety or spirituality. No, I think that's a violation of the fifth commandment. I mean, imagine, imagine if you're, if you are, um, you were a just a, a, you know, a five-year-old kid and you recall that your grandfather who worked his whole life had a lot of money and he's like, I'm going to build a church downtown. It's a beautiful church. And then now, you know, 30 years later, you're the minister of it. And well, the Muslim wants to buy it. The highest bidder is a Muslim. Oh, well. Sheepish, like I can't, I can't fight against that. That would be against church and state or something. I got, I got to just, you know, be back. That would be a dishonoring of your grandfather, and that's just one example. But if you have a heritage of faith in your society and you spoil that, is that not just as much, if not in a way worse, than um, a, a worse violation than even dishonoring your grandfather? That an entire people, more than that. Like our country, the heritage of faith of our country is not just 19th century. It's not even 18th century. It's 17th century. And this, the faith of the 17th century is rooted in the 15th century. And the 15th century, they said we're Catholic and they identified with the Christians all the way back to the, the apostles. So if you are, if you are privileged enough, to be born into a social environment that has at least a fading heritage of faith, wouldn't wouldn't you wouldn't your obedience to the fifth commandment be you acting to honor those people who bequeath that heritage to you by strengthening that heritage? And not only that, you strengthen the heritage not only for yourself or not only in honor for your grandfathers, but in honor for the future generations. It's um, it's it's bizarre. Like it's uh, talk about like Anabaptist. I mean, I I, I don't. Uh, it's and, and when I say like take what's ours in Christ, do do you think that do you think that even our American founders thought that we can honor them by letting our country get taken over by you know practical atheists, non Christians? Do do you think we honor? that they would consider that honorable, that th their people, their posterity from the preamble to the Constitution are the ones handing over what they built to people who either want to destroy it or have no interest in it? It's, um, yeah, it, it is. It, I, I've, I have worse words than sheepish <laughs> for that, that I'll keep to myself. Um, Okay. Um, when I say claim ours in Christ, that means two things. One, it means that Christ blessed this nation and we are the benefactors of that. The other side to that is it is true that this world is in a way, is the churches, like the, the, the people of God, this world is yours. Why? Because you're co-heirs in Christ. When you look at, when you look around in the world and you see its beauty, and its riches, you should acknowledge that this this is a gift of this is a gift of God in Christ, because we're co-heirs to. I mean, I, I don't think this earth is going to. I think it's going to be glorified. Heavens and earth, all that's going to be glorified. I don't think it's going to be burned up. Um, the same thing in substance is going to live on in the eschaton, and so we can look around and say, "This is ours." Right, and that doesn't justify us stealing because in this dispensation, um, there God has granted to non-believers the right to their the, the the fruit of their labor. So I'm not advocating. I say this in the book that we have no right to take anyone's uh, you know legitimately acquired stuff, um, even, even heretics. Like this is one thing that people oppose Roman Catholics for. Like if a heretic is even punished, like you can't take their property, um, you can't do that. So. Um, or even like an infidel. But if you're, in, if you are, if, if your heritage, your people is a heritage of faith, and this, this land was claimed for the Christian religion, then you have a double interest. You can not only view it eschatologically as yours, 
but even in the present life as yours, because this place was made for you, for the posterity of Christian, by the post, you know, for the posterity by your their Christian ancestors. All right, I could keep rambling on, um, but this that he, he, who's getting we're both getting fired up, Chris. Let's see. Here's a statement that gets to the heart of my concern on that. He's the one that cleansed the temple. Okay. I, and, and by the way, that was a sort of redemptive historical act. I'm not, Calvin even cautions. I'm not sure that applies to everyone. No, but it applies, um, to, it applies to Jesus. Amen. Amen. The, the zeal for God's house yeah, consumed but, him. So he wasn't dead. But inside. what was the example specifically, Doug? That, well, let me answer. What was the example specifically First Peter Jesus left us? Yeah. The example is when he was insulted, he did not insult. When he okay. was beaten, it did not beat. He entrusted himself to him who judges righteously, and then he suffered and died on the cross. Just, so uh, was Jesus sheepishly tolerating the assaults against him? Uh, sheepishly? No, as a warrior king. I'm, I'm just pointing out that cleansing of the temple meant that he did pass Wolf's test. And not, I wasn't talking about what example he set for us that we're commanded to follow. We are we are commanded in Peter to follow the example and follow in his steps to follow the you know to accept. The slings and arrows that get thrown at us. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's by a cross, my friend, a cross. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Someone's like, muted, muted. <laughs> Let me start over. So let's just say that you, your family are, you are in a, um, you're in like a, a land that has a lot of uh, Muslims and it's like Nigeria. And you're practicing your Christian faith and your Christian family, your kids are Christians and a bunch of Muslims show up and they're going to steal your kids and they're going to take them away. Are you just going to well, the cross said, I just got to be passive. I got to be passive. Oh, oh, it's very sad. I mean, I'm, you're, you know, you're sad, but I can't do anything to stop these men. Um, let's say it's just one man. Let's say it's just one puny little man. And he just has a really desire for Allah to be, to be, to receive glory via your kids. And, um, what do you do? Do you, do you punch him in the nose? Do you stab him with a, a, a knife? Do you shoot him with a gun? I bet you would. I would. I bet most people would. I think even John Piper would. <laughs> he's, he's had some weird passive comments in the way in the, back, in the past. Isn't that doing, are, are you following the way of the cross in that example? Or you're using a power, individual power, to oppose evil, to extinguish evil, to prevent evil. That is a power granted as a gift of God to you as an individual. And you are resisting this guy who does, who only wants to convert your kids to Islam through force, turn them into military children so they can go shoot at other Christians. Um, you would stop. So the, the logic of his position means you have to be pacifist in the face of evil, even when you have the power to stop it. I don't know how else to understand the principle at work behind this. Civil power is a, a power ordained of God. The same is true of the power ordained for you as a father, as a husband of the household, as an individual or whatever. And you should use that power for good. If in the civil realm, you have moral degeneracy that is harming people, including potentially your own kids, if not your kids, your neighbor's kids, if not your neighbor's kids, the next neighbor's kids, next neighborhood's kids, you should use that power to prevent the harm and promote the good. So I, I uh, again, his principle he applies it to the civil realm, and the Escondido people do this. They apply a principle, a moral principle of, pa of passivity to the civil realm in the face of evil. But they wouldn't apply that same principle in other areas of life, especially when it means your individual ability to resist evil towards your kids or whomever. So, 
But again, what's my case? I'm not just saying it's like he's inconsistent. I'm saying the case is God ordained the powers in this world for good, and we are the people who are granted those powers, that is humanity in general, and so humanity in general ought to order society to good. If, this is, if the people in charge now want to order society to degeneracy, then we have available means, either it's a constitutional means, um, uh, people can, can conduct revolution if it's appropriate and suitable and feasible and acceptable to seize the power and then order society as best they can to the good. Um, so this idea of the glory of the cross, if you follow through logically what he's saying, it leads to you completely passive in the face of every kind of evil. And it, yeah, so it's, I don't think he'd live up to that consistently and it would be bad if he did. That the victory was won. Um, I think Wolf's whole project has distracted Christians. Another one of my big concerns. And he says, well, I'm not engaging scripture. I'm doing political theory. Yeah, right. You've used scripture where you want. You left out the index, by the way. You use scripture where you want. And that's a good example. But anyways, let me read this. Turretin on uh, post, well, I call it postmillennialism. It's Kiliasm, but it's the precursor to postmillennialism. Here's why that statement. Wait, wait no. Kiliasm is a precursor to premillennialism. I disagree. Okay. <laughs> I just well, I disagree. All right. All right. If there should be a time of a thousand years in which the whole church, and not merely a certain part of it, should enjoy peace and felicity, how could the cross be called her characteristic? Or how would she be a church conformed to Christ her head, who was sanctified by affliction? Who ever told us it's supposed to go well for us here? This is the absurdity of the modern amillennialists. Okay, and I say this as a fellow amillennialist. Calvin talks the exact same way. Like, look at look at his commentary on Psalm 2, uh, especially, and his commentary on Psalm 110. He talks the same way. He says the church, um, because he's essentially a mill, the church will always be embattled, there'll always be enemies, and those enemies won't finally be crushed until Christ returns. Nevertheless, Calvin and Turretin and everyone else who was a mill back then, Luther, they all affirmed that civil authorities ordained of God should act for the good. Um, and I, I, so I, I, it's again, like I'm going to appeal to a guy to argue for a sort of pacifism that the, that the guy himself repudiates. <laughs> I don't understand it. How, how do all male people like how in their minds do they categorize these things? I, I don't know how they do it. Again, like Scott Clark lists like 50 people who believe on two kingdom theology. All 50 believe in Christian civil magistrates. I, I don't, how, how, is there like a, do they have like a magical block where suddenly they can just, okay, yeah, oh yeah, it's just Christendom crap. And then they just keep in, keep in the lane of this other stuff they think supports their, their essentially pacifist principle. The, the problem with, the, 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 the problem with, Post mill, as he's arguing, as Turretin's arguing, is that it creates a condition that in which there's no longer opposition. And he thinks that's not biblical. He thinks there will always be opposition. The fact of opposition does not preclude Christian civil society, Christian civil laws, Christian civil magistrates. It doesn't. It doesn't logically preclude that. The fact that you have a Christian state here doesn't mean that right next door there's not going to be a Muslim state that's in opposition to the Christian state. There's no contradiction. And then you can say, well, who are our enemies? I mean, you can broad it. You can say it's the Muslims. You can broad it even into people who are kind of dissenting on, on the inside and in, in the Christian state. But there's no logical, there's, it doesn't refute, it doesn't refute my claim no more than it refutes Calvin's or Turretin's or anyone else you want to cite on this, on this issue. It's just a bad argument, but all mill people, they get away over and over and over with this stuff. And then they, they give all mill a bad name, really. Like, I tend to think that, like, I don't want to get all mill, just, but they'll, they'll get into that and you'll talk about it later, but it just gets, it just gets, it's just so, it's aggravating to, to see how they can cite their sources without any, any recognition of the most glaring, obvious contradiction built into that. Oh, you know, you engage a little bit in your Christendom. You know, the Christians and Hebrews rejoiced in the plundering of their property. I'm not sure you could say that to a Christian nationalist today. You say it to me. 
Well, <laughs> I even have a hard time with that. So I, I would have a really hard time with that. But there, that's turning the other cheek to an extreme level. Right. Um, but I, I guess what I'm saying then is it seems like okay, Jesus is only Lord if it's going well for us. What about appointed persecution, suffering and affliction? And I know you're not going to disagree with this with this point, but what I have a real concern with here is that Abraham from the very call at the beginning, was dragged away from his homeland. Mm -hmm. He's told you're not to have loyalties, ultimately, to that homeland. You're supposed to leave that homeland and come to me. What I'm worried about is our place in this world. What I'm worried about is we have we are really pursuing a, a, a theology of glory, not a theology of the cross. What I'm worried about here is that we have forgotten that we're pilgrims, strangers, and aliens. What I'm worried about here is... What, what is the principle? What, what is the principle of action? Is it pacifism or is it something else? Is it pacifism or is it something else? These guys, they'll say we're strangers, we're pilgrims. Okay. Does that mean we, we can't ever use powers for good? Why does that only apply to the civil state? Does it apply elsewhere? It seems to me that if Chris is consistent, then he would follow the route of, of John Piper, who essentially said, as I understand, I could be wrong, but I thought he said something like, if a guy comes into my house and wants to steal my stuff or, you know, kill my wife or whatever, I'll just, you know, I can't, I can't resist. I, now, Piper may not have said that. Certainly people have said that for a long time. Is that, again, like, what is, what is the moral principle of action in relation to our, the God-ordained powers for good um, through which we act for good in society or in our families or in our individual lives. What's the moral principle? Um, the, the theology of glory thing, when I say that we should have Christian laws, Christian matters for Christian uh, society, all that, I'm not talking about turning the earthly life into heavenly life. I deny that so many times in the book. What I'm saying is there is a human good and there's a human, there's a power ordained of God for humans to use for that good. We should use that power ordained of God for that human good. That's all I'm saying. Do I think we're going to create like materially like a per perfect world? Do I even think the post mill future is right? I, I don't think that's right. Nevertheless, when it's in the, our opportunity to bring about what is good in the world for ourselves and our neighbors, we ought to act and do that. Again, that has nothing to do with eschatology. It has nothing to do with the, the, like a theology of the cross or theology of glory. Again, thrown out by uh, literally, it was Luther. They they pull that from Luther, who again was on who wanted Christian civil magistrates to to promote true religion. So it's just like it, it's it's bizarre. Um, yeah, I mean, Doug, Doug can deal with the. If this is a post mill objection, Doug can deal with that. It it doesn't do anything to me. Um, and if it were to do anything to me and Chris, it would turn us into radical pacifists. So, and I think that's absurd and false. Uh, we have become so earthly minded right. that we are no heavenly good. <laughs> but, uh, you remember, so, remember something. There's, <laughs> there's an important thing to note here. I'm I'm not this. Okay, I, I keep, I know, I keep stopping whenever you, we're only like 20 minutes into this thing. I agree that we should be heavenly minded, okay? But you can only be heavenly minded to the, to the maximum extent if you have food in your belly, if you have enough water, if you're not worrying about tomorrow that uh, you're not going to have a job or have any money. Um, you can't go to church effectively if there's so much disorder in the streets that you can't drive to church or walk to church. You can't sit in church while all around you, maybe there's people committing crimes and you've left your home and now you're wondering, did some guy break into my house to steal my stuff? You have to be earthly minded. You, you can set a hierarchy of heavenly and earthly minded without making a zero sum game. If you don't have the earthly mindedness, you can't have effective heavenly mindedness, or at least ordinarily. I'm sure that under like suffering, people can do that. But ordinarily, I mean, you know, Presbyterians, they can, they can pull this off, I guess. But ordinarily, for most people, you have to have the heaven, the, the earthly goods set up such that the heavenly goods can be uh, procured without distraction or molestation or that sort of thing.
Again, same thing with the body. You eat breakfast, you drink coffee, um, you put the suit and tie on, you go to church, maybe not in California, but you put the suit and tie on in, uh, in um, where do I live, North Carolina, and you go to church and now you're ready for worship. Same thing with the body politic. Um, and the thing in the book, I repeatedly say, this is even a noise like the some of the One Kingdom Kyperian guys. I'm the guy who makes a distinction between earthly and heaven. I'm the guy who orders one to the other. I'm the one who says that actually the ultimate end of all earthly life is heavenly life without conflating or compounding those two things. Um, so I absolutely agree that you can't, if you focus on earthly life, you're going to lose, you're going to lose the heavenly life if you focus too much. Um, but actually, if you put those in a hierarchy and you focus on both, that's the complete human being. That's you being a complete person. You care about the earthly good such that it contributes to the, the heavenly. So I think this is like a, a gross misunderstanding. It's importing ideas of post mill onto me um, and uh, of certain post mill things onto me. And it's just Plan true. a violin or anything like this here. You introduced me. Tucker said that I was the most controversial pastor in America. I'm also one of the most reviled pastors in America. Okay, so I know what it's like to be lied about. I know what it's like to be insulted. I know what it's like to be sure. attacked. I know what it's like to have property. Th you know, I've. Uh, well, I have, I have a feeling I'm going to learn about it after this interview. But go ahead. <laughs> right. Hey, hey. So, uh, the, uh, the, there are stories I could tell you, and the, the so. But the point is, I am not preaching a lazy boy Christianity, disguise, you know, with the rhetoric of a theology of glory. Yeah, but there's there's a the, the rugged masculinity thing, you know, kind of puff out the chest and. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand no quarter November, but I think the well, thing you're that... You're supposed to understand it. You're supposed to laugh at it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a joke. it's a joke. Face okay, seeking okay, understanding. Face seeking okay, understanding. Okay, all right. But you're out there blowtorching things. Yeah. Um, you can't You can't imagine how much fun that was. Okay, man. I'm sure it was fun, but that's the kind of thing, you know, you know, you, you just keep to yourself. Like, because of our of our situation. <laughs> this is how I, I got... Well, several things. I got... Uh, one, of, one of my favorite lines, I've dropped this before, that Doug said was... <laughs> he says we're surrounded at the Alamo and I, you can have three ways of being faithful you know the first first way is you walk out and you say uh, we've considered all of our options sir and uh, we've decided we must fight you know, so you walk back and you fight second option is you walk out with a stern voice you say you're about to fight you you're going down you know we've decided he's like that's faithful too but I recommend the third option which is you walk out and look at your enemy and say hmm I don't think so Skippy <laughs> so the, 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 the blowtorch is uh joy and not being worried or bent out of shape uh so that that's that's a yeah, sign yeah that's that's your interpretation <laughs> well, but that's not everyone else's i'll tell you that you know i, I mean i want to say some of these guys i'm not not coming after you here but you know if you're going to do the rugged masculinity thing some of you guys need to get to the gym i mean it's like you know so i have a hard time with that whole thing um just because you're, you're agreeing with stephen wolf there by the way what he, he thinks people should, yeah. He, he, he big, if he's, I accept his premise, if I accept well, no, you're, his yeah, he's a big go to the gym guy too. The, I want to talk about this. Uh, this the way that you talked about post mill, like he's lazy boy, lazy river. The, it's um the advancement of the kingdom is like a D Day advancement kind of thing. And this would even go to the quote that you read is like, well, there's of course there's going to be taking up the cross, but it's taking up the cross to sack men. The blessing comes on the other side of the cross. So the same way it worked for our Lord. It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. Well. You lay down your wife, your life for your wife. What happens? Well, you you sanctify her. She's sanctified. She's washed. She's blessed. And things things on the back end, the fruit comes because you were toiling, because you were going about your work. It's the same principle with the kingdom. So it's not. I would I would very much agree and warn people against any concept of like a post mill concept where you're going to get to a point and you're going to chill. You know, you're going to chill. And that's like what it's about. No, it's always about the advancement of God's kingdom as we pray, as we labor, as the, we... The worry worship. about theology of glory is if someone thinks they're going to stroll into the millennium with their hands in their pockets, go straight, going straight to the glory and no cross, um, that's just ludicrous. It's just ludicrous. As just, uh, I mean, um, I, I think this is where like, like two, like two kingdoms, um, like the two, two kingdom theology can be actually be helpful in this regard. There is, but when you don't, when you don't affirm like two kingdoms, it's easy to, to think that, um, the kingdom of God just kind of rises from out of nowhere. You know, you don't even know where it came from. Um, and it, it's not an actual, it's not a product of political action, but th these guys actually seem to be repeating that at the same time. So, um, but I, I talked about this in a different video, but, uh, just keep going. Chris. But the opposite is also the case. There are people who are living a perpetual crucifix. 
Christ is always on the cross, and it's not the narrative. It's the death and resurrection. So um, there's the old blues song that says, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Um, there, the pattern that we are given in Scripture over and over again <laughs> is you lay down, you take up your cross daily, you follow Christ, you're willing to die. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. All of those things are true, but this, it's a story. God vindicates his people. And so when God raises uh, Jesus from the dead and he calls us to follow him, we're called to follow that whole pattern. We're called to follow him through the story, which means there are going to be dark valleys and there's going to be triumphant victories. And in right, I mean, he, I agree that Hebrews 11 catalogs that, right? It goes back and forth, but that's that's to the providence of the Lord, yeah, absolutely, right? right. Okay, um, in terms of um, Sermon on the Mount ethics, I guess what I, I'm concerned about is what becomes a distinctively Christian character when we, we come into positions of power. Um, law is inherently coercive, this is what you do, and there's <sighs> It's, it seems to me it becomes Minecraft and Soulcraft at this point, that that's what we've seen in history with this. And do you ever think that the Lord specifically doesn't want something to be labeled specifically Christian? Number one, because then you're making it holy, sanctified, set apart. The only institution we have for that in the New Covenant that's specifically designated that way is the church when Jesus spoke to Peter. He he made these governments common at the beginning. That's that's what we talked about from Genesis 9. They're common, they're legitimate, they're provisional, they're going to expire. Um, but don't you think he wants to keep us out of pers- uh once out of positions of power precisely because the the this the otherworldly ethic that we are supposed to carry with us would be threatened and lost. I'm just kidding. I'm just making um, so much to say there. Um, it, it is, it, it would be odd. Wouldn't it be odd if God ordained a power for our good that therefore we can, we cannot actually, um, wield it good. I mean, civil political power is good because it comes from God. His purpose is good. And yet we as Christians have to treat it as bad. So there, I, that seems to me to be a contradiction or at the very least we have to say, well, it's a contradiction because God's saying something good. And then also Chris is saying God's telling us that it's actually bad. Um, and so that's a contradiction. God is opposing God, which I think that's resolved by us saying that actually civil power is good. The idea of making something, calling something Christian makes it holy is a very strange thing. Everyone wants to kind of theologize these things. They want to take, well, a Christian church, Christian individual, that means they're they're saved and there's salvific grace involved and it's it's holy now and it's a set apart thing. But why don't we just think about practically what it means for there to be a Christian school? You know, he, he said he has a, his kids go to a Christian school. What is a Christian school? I said this before, like the, the, they, they teach two plus two equals four. They also teach Christian theology and the Christian aspect of, of the entire institution shapes the whole of it. So it's not just the addition of theology. It's that the life of it, the learning of even the, the things that are common become, uh, are Christianized in a way. Is that school rendered holy in the same way that a school is rendered holy? No, actually, you can have ki- many kids there who are not actually Christian, kids that are not even actually of the elect. Um, and so that would we would all be okay with that calling that a Christian school because of the sort of things that it does, not only its self-identification, but the things that it does within the nature of the entity. So the same thing is true with a Christian nation. A Christian nation um does christian things it says we are christian it also does the basic earthly things you have plumbers and carpenters and engineers and all that um those are common and yet when you have a but it also acknowledges the true religion and it shapes the life as a whole around it It doesn't render it holy in the same sense as maybe israel's a holy commonwealth like the nation of israel the um old testament israel's a holy holy commonwealth it doesn't render it holy in the same way a church is um it it renders it a christian entity because of the self-identification of the things that it does so i i don't i think there's another talking point that just has got to go away uh what about like the christian family family itself is common so if if chris wants to say that um that well the common things cannot be christian 
then that means you can't have a Christian family because the family is common. Non-believers have legitimate marriages. They have legitimate families. They do family things. And when a family becomes Christian, what happens to that family is it does is analogous to what happens in the nation. It now does Christian things. It now does Christian worship. It forgives one another Christ. It prays together in Christ. It does it that's what makes that entity a Christian thing. And it's also, by the way, a natural thing. So the natural, a natural thing becomes Christian. A common thing becomes Christian. But when it does that, it doesn't eradicate it nat its naturalness. And a, a, a non-believing family doesn't become Christian and then somehow the, the naturalness of that family unit, the naturalness of the marriage of one man and one woman um, having or, or with or expecting children doesn't change. Those principles remain. But now it's both added the Christian things and is completed by Christianity. So same thing with the nation. So I think that objection just the, the the absurdity it leads to denying you can have a Christian school. It denies you can have a Christian family, um, Christian charities. Let's say you have a charity that is not tied formally to any kind of uh, any kind of church. It's an independent charity. What makes it a Christian charity? Well, it probably has a Bible study. It might have certain moral standards for people to enter in, enter into it something like that um as a bible study it prays that's what makes it a christian charity it, you have plenty of charities that are not christian and they can do perfectly good things they help the homeless as well but what's a christian charity well they help the homeless not only bodily but also spiritually um preferably of course feeding them into churches once they become saved but but that's what you know so otherwise like the charity is natural in a way or it's at least civil it's a civil entity it's a civil association for good. Um, so anyway, I can keep sure. I understand. Are you, um, this is, is this question from like a group or a position that thinks Christians shouldn't become civil authorities? No, I'm not. I'm not Anabaptist. Like he, like, but you like, doesn't he want to keep us from positions of power? I'd no, say no. I would he, say, I get, okay, let, let me be clear on that. Right. What I'm saying is, is that having specifically Christianized government, right? Okay. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. I'm not saying Christians can't get into positions of power. I, I, um, uh, you know, as a Christian, just like I'd run my business, I think there's a parallel. I would be, I would hopefully be a good Christian in that, in that, in that arena, in that sphere. I hope I would do things justly and honorably, but to impose it and sanctify the institution and call it holy at that point, deeming it that way because we've Christianized it. Maybe it's just the adjective Christian, Christian on everything that's really causing the issue here. It's Luther's comment where you, a cobbler is not a Christian cobbler by putting little crosses on the shoes. Um, he, he's a Christian cobbler by making good shoes. Right. There are times. Well, right. I've said that. I say that this in the book that um, a, Chris, a, a Christian, a nation, a Christian nation is not Christian simply because it has in its constitution that it's a Christian nation. A Christian nation is a nation that does Christian things. If it doesn't do Christian things, then you can say it's Christian nation formally, in a way, I guess. But what I have in mind as a Christian nation is a nation that does Christian things, similarly with a uh, Christian family and school and charity. When God wants the magistrate to uh, simply do the job and not drag Jesus into it, like you've got to have John three sixteen attached to everything. Just, just do your yeah, job. I don't want the magistrate messing with religion must have all, much right. at all. I, I, we're, I don't. we're pretty lame about that. And I also don't want like the guy that has a sprinkler company just like slapping a sticker on his bumper and that being like a Christian right. business. But at the same time, at the same time, Daniel made a point of praying with his windows open. Yeah, I mean, okay, he didn't stop. He didn't. He didn't shut out his Christianity when he left the well, church, well, no, right? He, and he opened his door. He showed it. He could have. He, he could have yeah. defied. He could. Well, he, I, well, he, he did defy. He, no, he he could have prayed secretly, as Jesus says to do. No, I preach that, and I, I agree with you. Right. Like it's really remarkable. Daniel wanted that scene. There are times. That's my point. There are times when it's important to attach the name of Christ to it, and there are times when it's simply not, not necessary. Okay, I know Kuiper, anti-revolutionary party, w believed you could have a Christian. You could have a Christian government. Right. That was assumed. It was received from Protestants. It was handed to them from the Middle Ages, the whole Christendom. You know. There it is. There, there it is. This is like the common R2K response. Instead of dealing with their actual arguments, which are extensive, 
uh, they, they don't just state it. I mean, they often do actually just state it. Just it was kind of assumed, but they had there are arguments throughout history. You can read Rutherford's uh, free, disputa free disputation on the pretended liberty of conscience, which you have, you have to read that on. Yeah, it's not it's not published unfortunately. I think it will. I think uh, RHP will publish it. You could also read um, John Cotton's arguments with Roger Williams. It's not as if these guys just received it. These things were received and defended. And why is that? Because even early on, even into the in the 16th century, there were people arguing for a type of religious uh, liberty, N nothing like what he's talking about. Um, but th there were people. And so there were defenses of it. And this is why they saw the need to argue for it for hundreds of years because people opposed it. So the idea that they just received it from Christendom is like this R. Scott Clark talking point. You hear it from Horton, you hear it from even like like Van Druen's interesting because I've never seen him like ignore like argue. Well, maybe he has. I don't want to say he hasn't. But I'm just saying the general talking point is that they it's like received and it's not actually defended. It's some sort of again, like th these guys can write thousand word treatises on theology covering every topic imaginable with complexity that no theologian can do today, but somehow they just received just like, they just, they just received it from the middle ages and never thought about it. That's just how things are. And that, and, that, and then, and, and that's what, maybe that's how they can, they can cite these, uh, these confessions and they can cite these guys. Oh, Calvin said this about theology of the cross and Turretin, and then somehow block out all that other stuff. Uh, in which they make arguments directly demonstrating to their minds and my minds the necessity of a Christian civil order. I don't think going back to that arrangement is helpful or even possible. The whole thing's a pipe dream, by the way, in our current situation. You know that. That's why you're saying 500 long years down the line. Three get, yards in a cloud yeah, of dust. Yeah, yeah. I, get, I get that. Yeah. Um, but but I guess, oh, I'll, I'll still come back to that. <laughs> but, um, but we agree. The, 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 ser the Sermon on the Mount I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned. We, we've already beat this point. Sermon on the Mount, the Christian ethic, the meek, the humble, um, these are not the characteristics I'm seeing of Christians at the moment. I think we need to be really careful. So I'll just say that. Yeah. How, how well, so let me, let me make this point. Even if he's right that among Christian nationalists, he's not seeing behavior um, that, that fits the demands of the Sermon on the Mount, even if that is true, that in itself, if he's right, should be corrected. But that doesn't necessarily mean that our political theology and political theory is false. It just means the manner we go about maybe expressing it or the manner we go about um, uh, kind of confronting people who disagree, that would be an error. But that doesn't say anything about the substance of the argument. Um, and th people can do this as kind of a, it, it's like a, a type of Jesus juke where you can say the you know, again the manner is is sinful therefore the ideas are bad but that actually doesn't logically follow um you see this a lot you see this a lot and uh so it, it doesn't work but uh even if he like if he is right then we ought to correct ourselves but correct ourselves in the manner of advocating yeah. satan's third assault again the devil took him to a very high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor all this i will give to you if you will bow down and worship me jesus said away from me satan for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan was really offering Jesus Christian nationalism. So, And Jesus said, I'm not going to receive that as a gift from you. I'm going to take it from you. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll I'm talk about Yeah, isn't that like the obvious point? I mean, because he did he did work and, and he he did in a way inherit it, and we inherit it with Christ. Right? We in in the eschaton, we do inherit it with Christ. No, but again, this goes back to the fact, I just, you know, I'll, I'll say it one more time, I guess. All these powers are ordained of God. They're for our good. If we can wield the power for good, we ought to. That's not to, again, make earth into heaven. It's not to pull down the, uh, the, the reign of, um, I don't know, the visible reign of Christ and, in, in, in the, or, or make the invisible invisible. Uh, it's not to, you know, um, uh, uh, I imminentize the eschaton. That's not the point. It's, uh, anyway, I'm not going to repeat it again. Resurrection. I'm, we'll I'm going to find the strong man and strip him of his panoply. 
So, yeah. and all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Yeah. I, I look forward to talking about that. So, we don't get from Jesus, though, Judaism, Judaism, nationalism. We don't get John 6. They wanted to force him to make him king. I realize what you would say. That's pre cross. I understand. Yeah. I understand that argument. Um, but even afterwards, even afterwards, as we see in Acts, Great Commission, we see them going out. We don't see them doing what you guys are proposing. Oh, we, absolutely. Um, so what we're proposing is a Christian house that needs to be built. In the Acts of the Apostles, all you see are people out in the field digging trenches and pouring footings. It, it, and the footings don't look anything like. Well, the, the th yeah, I should let Doug speak on that, but... I, I find this to be a, a strange objection too, because we're we're watching. We're, th those are the acts of the apostles. This is where maybe my two kingdoms theology shows up, where th they're there to preach the gospel, which is eternal life in Christ. That's like the that's the that's the principal role of a, of, a, of an apostle. I mean, obviously, for, to communicate the teachings of Christ um, for for all of Christian posterity. Same thing as uh, ministers, um, their principal job is to preach the things of eternal life for the good of your soul. And so it would actually be, given at least, at least my theology, it wouldn't, you wouldn't expect to find apostles who have a certain job or certain role in relation to um, our life in this world and the life to come to start preaching like, you know, take over the, like, become a Christian Roman emperor. emperor. So first, theologically, I would say that doesn't doesn't logically go against my position. Now, Doug can answer according to the post mill vision, which is almost in a way like the post mill vision is part of the gospel, which I kind of think it's like secondary, meaning that or it's an, a secondary effect of the gospel. Um, so there's a kind of a theological disagreement there, probably not much of a practical one. But also, there's the fact that they they, they knew that the highest good was preaching the gospel, and if, if anything was a pipe dream, it was a pipe dream for the apostles to now be like, oh, you got to take over this towns. Like, you know, there's like a 15, 20 person church and they're writing letters and they're saying, well, now you got to take over the town full of thousands of people. It's like, of, of course, they're not doing that when their principal concern is, is a spiritual health of people, um, of the, the small group people. So why, why would they? So, I mean, you can answer it as a post mill guy um, that the mission of the church is actually this kind of Christianizing everything. Um, whereas, was my my view is that as Christians, we again we're, we're human beings in a in a human social order, and we ought to pursue the good, not only the earthly but heavenly through that, um, and that's actually in support of the pos the apostles' mission. It's in support of ministers. If I were a civil magistrate um, in a Christian society, I would look at my pe the people and I would say. There are sets of goods that are common with you, and, and then there's also those goods, those Christian goods as well. I'm going to have an interest in ordering all of this to your highest good without neglecting the lower or inferior goods, but ordering everything to the highest good in the interest of, of, of your good. So, um, and again, that's in the support of the ministry, in support of the ministry. Um, it's not, I would say, it's not the role of the ministry to be like political advocates, leading l leading social movements, um, being at the forefront. I mean, that's what popes did, right? Leading the forefront of like armies in, in conquest. Um, that's not that's not what I think is is appropriate. But it is again, like, they should support the ministry for the highest good. Finished house. So does Constantine finish that house? No, Constantine messed up the first floor. Okay, <laughs> after killing his relatives, right? Well, um, so, so, but he, <laughs> here's the thing. Oh yeah. By, by the way, I apologize for the the voice not being dubbed right on there. On the, I don't know what happened. It was good for the first half, and then it suddenly went bad. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, so Constantine made Christianity legal. Um, Theodosius m made it sort of the religion of the empire. The so Theodosius is the good guy, right? In in this narrative, but Theodosius, there was a riot in Thessalonica, and Theodosius lost his temper and had like seven thousand Thessalonians killed. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's the Christian emperor. So the first Christian emperor of a Christian nationalism is guilty of a mass murder in Thessalonica. Yeah, I know, I know you, you don't want 1.0, you want 2.0. I, 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 I actually want 3.0, but okay. 2.0 is next. But Ambrose of Milan excommunicated him, right? And he had no regiments. He had no, uh, he, he, all he had was spiritual authority. 
I'm with Ambrose, not with Theodosius. And I, I, I know that there, are, there will be all kinds of atrocious things done in the name of Jesus in any kind of Christian national, nationalism project. I know that. But this is a fallen world. But don't you think that's precisely why, Doug, he doesn't want the adjective Christian slapped on a governing system? There's going to be an adjective of some sort attached to it. Why? I, I, I feel, I, what, I, what I believe Genesis 6 is saying is it shouldn't be. No, I'm saying that, that we, have, we have rulers, and they're either, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. That's all I'm saying. It's yeah. better to have the righteous rule than to have yeah, the wicked rule. Right, just, just, okay, if you want to do that, if we, you know, great. I, I, I would love to have a moral, godly man as president. Yeah. I mean, good luck, I, by the way. Yeah. No, <laughs> but no, that's, but that but, is but, the thing that we're You get my, you get my yeah. uh, so I would love to have that. Right. I just don't, I don't want the coercive power of the theonomic project as, and, and this is what you guys have to understand and appreciate the whole thing. That whole month, and you're tied, you, you, you know, rushed in the influence, apologia, you know, the, the whole thing is, is, is so built out of that entire system. You know, Doug, you say, you do say one thing, and then over here, you seem to say another, and it creates this muddled way of dealing with the whole movement that is pushing a theonomic system upon us that will be inherently coercive. And, and, and again, I think the, the fair question has been raised. You know, what branch of Christendom gets the power? I, I mean, what are you going to do with the Irish Catholics <laughs> immigrating? What are you going to do to the, the mosque down the street? You see, but you've already referred to the chapter in your Christendom. All right. So what do you do? Oh, which version of Christianity are you going to do? It's, it's as if like Americans have, have uh, completely forgotten their history. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming Chris Gordon is dis a descendant of, um, you know, Englishmen. It's as if they've forgotten the Anglo-Protestant order to liberty. It's, it's, it's as if they forgot that we in our Anglo-Protestant tradition developed a view of Christian liberty that, um, that you see aspects of it even in New England, and I'd argue for that, uh, in six, seven, uh, 17th century New England, it grows in the 18th century, not just because they read John Locke or all that, or they read Roger Williams, but because it was a, a, an experience with fellow Protestant brethren could coexist and even mutually support and love one another within a civil society of Protestants. And even though there were places where that didn't work out as well, you know, including the 18th century, that grew into, uh, I think that came culminated in the American founding in which there was actually a, a lot of, everyone essentially affirmed religious liberty, but undergirded by an Anglo-Protestant tradition. And so in the 19th century, we eventually get disestablishment, which I think was probably not wise, but but we get, but even in the midst of establishment within the, the American Republic post, um, 1800, you still have religion, people, religion is flourishing in a lot of ways such that even like Europeans will come to the new world, like Tocqueville, and they'll look around and say, this is the most religious people I've ever seen. And also there's no like Christian magistrate beating down heretics. And he was, he, it was a marvel to him because in Europe, in order to have a religious people, you had to essentially have a, you know, this is our religion, this is what you do. And, and, but in the United States, it wasn't the case. And so what I think, uh, what I think Chris Gordon is missing is that we have, in, again, the heritage of faith in the America, in America is one of ordered liberty undergirded by an, the, um, uh, an Anglo, an Anglo tradi political tradition that was itself also Protestant. Now, Protestantism is crucial for this. Because Protestants, um, they, they don't think that, that you have to be aligned with a, a specific institution in, on earth in order to be a true Christian. So there's no like earthly head. There's no papacy. There's no kind of like hierarchy that you have to be, uh, in, in order to be a true Christian. You don't have to be baptized in this institution or to be a true Christian. This is why Protestants, even all the way back into like, this is why, um, John Cotton in 1640-ish is saying, yeah, we allowed Baptists to be in our churches as full communicant members. They just, of course, could not talk about the fact they were Baptists, but they they affirmed the mutual faith of Baptists. They just said that, look, this is a Congregationalist project. 
Um, we, we recognize your true faith, but we, we're not going to allow you to undermine that project. That's, that was the argument of Congregationalists, and they only acted against Baptists when they, when they violated that rule. So, um, John Cotton even said, he says Baptists were allowed, he says even antinomians were allowed. Um, this was one of the disputes between Cotton and Roger Williams over the Church of England, because John Cotton said that the Church of England and the ministers there, the Church of England is a true church, with, uh, or at least the churches, I don't know if he said that, like, he wouldn't say the formal structure is true church, but he said that the churches of New England are true churches with true gospel ministers. Now, how did this come up? Well, because Roger Williams was saying, we have to excommunicate the people who, when they travel back to England on business or whatever, they would attend these churches and they would go to Church of England and they'd be under the gospel ministry of, you know, what we'd call Anglicans. And John Cotton's like, look, we're, we're not out churching, we're not like ex churching these people. They are true churches with true ministers. We just disagree with the structure and some other things, and also like the the politics. But they can come back and be full, continue to be full members uh, in our churches. It was it was Roger Williams who was the nut, by the way. He was a sectarian nut. So whenever someone was like Roger Williams, like dude, he was a complete sectarian nut. Um, so that that was even in so even in like the 17th century, you have uh, people who we have to like hate on nowadays, the Puritans, acknowledging people's mutual faith who disagreed in theology. Samuel Willard, Willard says this really explicitly. I don't have the quote. It's a great quote. Um, and Samuel Willard was one of the guys who tried to suppress the Baptists who were violating the rules. Um, then you go in the 17th, uh, 18th century, you have Cotton Mather preaching the ordination sermon of a Baptist in downtown Boston. That was in 1717, I believe. That's kind of a big deal. Um, and then, of course, you have the First Amendment and it goes from there. But the point is that the, there's a tradition of Anglo-Protestantism that's rooted in experience. And it was the, the, um, the gradual acknowledgement of the possibility of a civil order of Protestants without the sort of bloodshed he's talking about. So my vision, and I said this cl clearly in the book, is that a lot of that stuff that happened in Geneva is okay in principle, but we are Americans, and Americans have a heritage of faith that has a strong religious liberty um, foundation. Now, that religious liberty, the foundation of that foundation is Protestantism. It is, it is more specifically, it's Anglo-Protestantism, but you know, you can go into how, how people can conform, non-Anglos can conform to it and all that, but I won't get into that. Um, so, all that being said, um, which church is going to run things? I would say if Americans are going to return to their heritage of faith, they are a tolerant Protestantism. Um, yeah, that, that's what I would want to return to. Now, is that a pipe dream? I mean, I don't know. Uh, if like, transgender people 20 years ago, you said it's a pipe dream, you're going to be accepted and you're going to get people fired or misgender you. Um, so uh, I, I think things change very quickly. And really, usually it takes a matter of, it's a matter of will. Like, I've said this so many times, but like, in the end, like, the change happens. Change happens when the a dedicated minority say we're going to do things. So that's what it comes down to. You have to have that strong political will to see things happen. You have to face opposition, but with prudence. Um, so I, I think he's. I would just tell Chris to just remember the heritage that you come out of and that heritage is an anglo protestant tolerant people of ordered liberty that is rooted in protestantism that can um in which religion can flourish even in religious diversity um and without kind of a heavy-handed type uh, magistrate saying don't do this do this i argue the central theonomic imperative is to limit the government that's the central thing. My my project is not to get the apparatus to seize control of the currently swollen government and then use that apparatus to make a bunch of people do a bunch of Christian things. That is absolutely antithetical to the project I I would have want to have anything to do with it. Do with if if I had my theonomic way, the federal government would be one tenth its current size and would be not uh, we'd be restraining the biggest blasphemer first, not going around bossing people around i'm i'm a theocratic i'm a theocratic libertarian but i do think though that it is inherently coercive but that's that's like as you've you've said this earlier this is that's all law that's all civil authority that's what they're doing they're, the they're... job of government so the, the thing people have to realize this that um 
they think theonomy, they, they think law, and that's a good, good thing. They should think law. But, but you, know, you know what controls us nowadays? It's not law that controls us. Um, what, what controlled 19th century when Tocqueville said that, um, that people in the United States are Christian be, outwardly because in, if they were, if they admitted that they're atheists, it would be, it would go, it wouldn't go well with them publicly. That's not the civil magistrate saying, you know, you can't say that or do that. It's just the, the people the, it's that the people don't accept that belief. There's an expectation of behavior and expectation of, of what beliefs are allowed to be expressed. Now you think that's coercive and that's bad, but our entire world today is controlled by that. And, and my guess, even though I appreciate Chris has not brought up like the R word racism, I don't think he does, but if you are, if again, if you are, if you are accused of, I mean, let's just go straight to like, the, the reason I bring up racism is, is because I, and I don't bring up transgenderism, even though it's kind of the same thing. It's that racism is everyone in the Christian world in America will join in on beating down the racist. Okay. So the Christians will write negative reviews about that racist pizza parlor guy just as quickly as a non-Christian or someone else. Okay. They're going to write the one star review just as much as the other guy. So we already take part in a type of social control. And if I asked you, is it good that society looks down upon the racist? Most likely all these guys would say yes, which means they're acknowledging the legitimacy of a power that is a sort of soft power. It is coercive because you affirm one thing and now you're being coerced by society not to express it. So everyone affirms that that heavy co that that type of coercion. Everyone affirms that society should have certain beliefs, not even manner, not even positions, but um, but there should be certain beliefs that should be suppressed socially through different social means, from losing jobs to getting negative reviews to I don't know, getting getting uh, mobbed on Twitter, um, whatever it is. Everyone already believes that. Now my argument, and I think this is true of the 19th century is that atheism should be one of those things. And I think there's good reason for that. You look at the political positions of atheists and they're atrocious. They're, they're like, they're, they're directly antithetical to the common uh, evangelical conservative. So th they, sh should they not be suppressed? I mean, the irony is that like people you deem racist usually vote the same way you do, by the way, evangelical Christian. Um, and yet you want to suppress them, but you don't want to suppress the atheist who does the exact opposite. So yeah, I'm just saying, if we're going to acknowledge that there is a show, this social power, and we're going to acknowledge that these certain beliefs are bad for society, why do we just kind of sheepishly follow whatever, you know, the regime says is bad when we, as, and, and we take part in it, why don't we instead take part in suppressing atheism? Even if it's just for civil concerns, like the, all the founding fathers believed that religion is necessary for a flourishing society. Why do we follow the dictates of the of the founders, and follow and and say the atheists or the agnostic or whatever should not have should not have any sort of institutional or social power should be suppressed? So, all all these guys affirm coercion. Now they may not like how it always pans out in the end for people. But everyone al al already affirms it. So this like, oh, it's coercive, it's coercive. I mean, BS. I, I think people don't realize what they're doing when they join a mob to get to, to attack the guy who's violated the social dogma. There is social dogma. Um, and again, I think that social dogma should be oriented towards Christian things. At the very least, yeah, it should, it should yeah, so. Uh, to make, impose morality? Yes. Make, yeah. You may okay. not kill. What, what, historic, not generally. You may stop, not kill babies. Stop killing the babies. Fair that's, enough. Okay. That's yeah, a, but absolutely. The, but, because I, that, but that's a, that can be a natural law argument. Sure, well, but it's imposing morality. But the natural, yeah. but this, yeah, I do but, think well, this is well, the principle. What I'm saying is, it's the natural law argument. Natural law. Natural law argument. I addressed this in the previous issue, but for the people who are new here, just so you know, like, 
the first table of the law deals with our duties to God. The second table deals with our duties to fellow man. Excuse me. Um, all of that is the moral law of God from commandment one to commandment 10, summarizing the moral law. And that moral law as expressed in the 10 commandments is a, a different mode of learning about what the natural law is. So if you're gonna talk about the natural law, you're talking also and principally about the first table. Right. So if you're about enforcing the natural law, then you're all about enforcing the first table of the law. Um, th th there's a, like the, the modern 2K guys do this, like well, natural law this and natural law that. It's like, do you guys not know? <laughs> um, I mean, there's also the part too that if, if, if you're going to only enforce the first table without or the, the second table without acknowledging the first table, you're effectively acknowledging the second without in reference to God. So it's atheistical, which is actually goes farther. It goes farther than the old pagan societies that developed out of common grace. Literally the vision of a modern 2K Escondido guy, I, I don't think it's unfair to say it is political atheism. It is political atheism. They want moral behavior in society without the laws or the people uh, or, you know, or the, the institutions acknowledging God. And to acknowledge God is to acknowledge a triune God. Um, and, and so literally they're, they're more extreme than any sort of pagan society. Uh, the pagan societies acknowledged that you have to have some kind of reference to the divine. I mentioned this earlier, reference to the divine in order to shore up the rest of the commandments. Now, the idolatry that they committed in the first table often led to uh, moral error in their, in their application of the second. But under common grace, let's call it common grace, their, their, even their false idolatry of the first table held them in check such that they could fulfill parts of the second table. But if you, if you remove God from the picture, all you have are these command, these arbitrary kind of commands. And guess what you get? I mean, literally, when you have a state of neutrality, of, as we've had for like the past few decades, you then get people not only like, it's not only polygamy for like the seventh commandment, it's that they're throwing the whole, the seventh commandment out completely. Right? So, so the, the point being is that in a modern atheistical society, it doesn't merely corrupt the second table, it throws out the second table entirely. So if you're going to have a complete body of law, if you're going to have complete ordered people, you need people who are conforming to the full law. That is from commandment one to commandment 10. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you have laws that, that strictly direct the first table. Like I said, the 19th century, um, of course there was problems in the first table, you know, all that, that all that, but there was the, what enforced in a way, an approximation of the first table was actually more of society and kind of a heritage and, and a culture more than coercive law. Nevertheless, what, what, what kept the, the, that second table, you know, followed, um, though of course imperfectly, was the completeness of the acknowledgement of the entire table of the law, both tables of the law. Um, so again, if you're atheistical, if you, if you follow political atheism, you don't just corrupt the second table, you eliminate it. Absolutely. But there's the, the natural law arguments that are based on the basic moral law of God. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you're going to enforce, how you're going to enforce second commandment. I don't know how you're going to enforce. And you, you even in mere Christendom make real cl clear that we need to be careful of enforcing third commandment before so, we go you know, to Kuiper, be Kuiper believed fourth, right. right? He believed fourth, but just as preserving the day, right. as I understand it. Yeah. Okay. I want, I want to highlight something before you get into like the, yeah, first table, second table, you get all those kinds of issues, but. So second table is tricky or second table. The, the second commandment is tricky because that concerns the manner of worship, you know? So that, that's probably, I, I would admit that the second table is 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 the is the challenging part for Christians among other Christians 
This is where like the Church of England got in a lot of trouble. This is why the Puritans left. There was a sense in which the second table was being enforced upon them and they didn't agree and that, that caused a lot of problems. So I acknowledge like the second, I keep saying second table, that, that the, the second commandment, essentially saying you should worship God rightly, um, that that is tricky and has dangers built into it that you can see reflected in the, in the, in the tradition. But the first table is, condemns atheism. The first, uh, the first table condemns polytheism. I mean, condemns, condemns more than that. Um, but so, uh, and again, I, I, so I, I don't think that's hard. That wouldn't be hard to enforce ordinarily today. It might be a little challenging, but, but that wasn't difficult to enforce, um, for most of history, even going back to ancient Athens that Plato, um, wanted. Um, and so that's first table, fourth table or geez, uh, uh, the, the, um, fourth commandment. Uh, the fourth, the fourth commandment is you can do that in a variety of ways, meaning that you just cut off commercial activity. You just allow emergency sort of services and that's not too hard. We have that in full or partial in some counties and some places already today. Um, the, the third commandment of honoring the things of God. So, I mean, I don't know, not allow degenerate art or, or like religious art that is, um, that is offensive and violates the third commandment. Um, so I, I think that would be fine as well. I think we, we already do that with other forms of art. Um, so, but anyway, I, I, I don't think these things are off, uh, are completely off the table. Second, second command might be tricky though. Back to the adjectival thing, right? It's like you were, you brought up the question about it being Christian and we said, there's going to have something adjective and you said, I don't think it should have an adjective. And <clears throat> I think there are people that are, are basically thinking that way. Like it, we need to detach, Christianity from the, from the crown or from the civil authority. But the sweet psalmist of Israel, second Samuel 23, right? When, when a man rules over others in the fear of God, he dawns on them like. All right. So guys, I, it's, I've been doing this for a while. So I am going to stop. I think it's been almost two and a half hours. Um, actually more than that. <laughs> uh, okay. But it's been fun. Almost three hours. Um, so I, I don't know who held it, who went all the way through. I will post this uh later on um as a regular video um probably won't be able to get to it today or tomorrow but maybe post it on wednesday and uh, i I'm, i apologize in the chats i didn't i didn't see I, I mean i know there's people commenting and there's i wasn't able to follow it all the way through i don't think there was a super chat um yeah you can follow me uh, it's getting hot in here too <laughs> i try not to i can't have the things too loud in here um, so I'm going to end it there. Do I have a mailing list? I do not have a mailing list. You can follow me on Twitter though. Um, but, uh, I, I will complete this later. I, I'm enjoying just, even if I don't even know how many people are listening, I have no idea. Um, but I'm enjoying doing this discussion. I think it's an opportunity for me to interact with some of these guys and give my ideas. So, all right. Thanks for hanging around. Thanks for watching. And we will complete this, um, a bit later.